All right, so um, how about we get started here? Let's turn off the music. So hi, everybody. My name's Brendan, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. I'm gonna first do like a little intro about myself, and then um, we'll install Reaper together. And then from there, uh, I'm gonna walk you through this extra configuration file that is part of what I'll be having you install today. When you install this configuration file, it overwrites whatever your previous configuration is. So part of what I'll be doing is, um, in, in the installation today is uh, walking you through backing up your installation as well. So in case you don't like my system or in case uh, the, the key commands, because the key commands will be different from Reaper's defaults. Um, they're based on a more of a Pro Tools style way of working. So uh, we'll do the installation. And then I'll sort of give like an intro to the Reaper interface and part of what makes it a little bit different than some other audio editing software. Um, and then I'll give you like a tour of this template. And then maybe if there's time, I can play, um, you know, a piece at the end and show you how some of these tools kind of work together and how it results in the kind of radio that I make. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, you know, I'm a radio and podcast producer. I'm probably best known for my um, sound design work. Um, I've always been an independent producer, freelancer. Um, I started in like 2006. I've been a consultant on various projects. Um, I teach lessons sometimes. A couple years ago, I directed Marvel's Wolverine podcast. So, and I also did the sound design for that. Um, before that, I spent about five years working with Nick Vanderkolk on the podcast Love and Radio, which is that's like kind of one of the first projects where I really kind of dug into Reaper and, and uh, learned what it could do. And actually, it's kind of funny to think that at the time, well, not even at the time, Nick and I never lived in the same city. Uh, so we were always collaborating remotely, which is obviously now something that... Um, you know, we're all <laughs> accustomed to doing. Um, but, you know, this was like 2010, 2011-ish. We were kind of figuring out how, how does this work collaborating remotely. Um, and uh, I was really insisting that we use uh, Logic Studio at the time. Um, and it wasn't until I did this kind of random freelance audio tour uh, that I finally started picking up Reaper. It was actually kind of this like boring audio tour that I... I um, I was like, well, let me take this opportunity to teach myself a new program. And once I started really digging into it and getting a sense of what it could do that other editors couldn't, um, that's kind of when I never looked back. I just uh, kept going farther and farther down the rabbit hole. Um, so what I'll be sharing with you today is kind of like the result of me being in that rabbit hole for like around 10 years um, and slowly building up this system that... Uh, like I said, it's based around a Pro Tools set of key commands, but um, adds my own sort of spin on it, which I'll be walking you through. And the whole idea behind this is that, you know, someone could learn this system. And uh, if their work requires them to have to jump over to Pro Tools from time to time, they'll still have a similar set of key commands that they can work with. And then simultaneously, for people who have been making radio for years and um, are maybe a more exclusive Pro Tools-based uh, workflow, that they can use the same system and um, use the same key commands and they'll feel at home. And uh, that will entice other people to give this program a try and see what advantages it has over Pro Tools. This is actually something that I've, I've had been wanting to do for years and years and years. Um, and it was only relatively recently that, well, first of all, that my configuration kind of got into a state where uh, it was something that I could share publicly. Um, and then the other thing is it's kind of like one of the side effects of the pandemic is that now that we have uh, Zoom and uh, and now that a lot of people know how <laughs> Zoom works, um, it's finally an opportunity for me to share this more widely. And um uh, but part of the reason why I'm doing it right now, right now, and I'm going to share my screen here, uh, some of you might know, there was an article that went around um, a little while ago, and this was the headline, Pro Tools Proficiency May Be Keeping Us From Diversifying Audio. And the author basically made the argument that, um, you know, because Pro Tools is so expensive, which it is, um, and because Pro Tools proficiency is something that a lot of jobs require, that we're actually setting up these, uh, you know, these barriers to hiring a more diverse pool of applicants in radio and podcasting. 
And that's something that I've been thinking about for a long time. And then, um, you know, after reading this, I was sort of like, well, you know, there are parts of this article I agree with, parts of it that I don't, but I do have the system that I think can actually address a number of the issues that the author is raising. So it felt like kind of the right time. Some of you might be asking, why Reaper? Like, why is Reaper uh, the program that I'm advocating? Uh, there are a number of reasons. Um, first and foremost, I think that uh, for software to be really effective in a collaborative radio and podcast kind of setting, it should be something that can work on both Mac and PCs. Um, it should be something that is really accessible for people to use. And it should run on a wide variety of machines. Um, and that's actually one of Reaper's particular strengths is that it can run really well even on older computers. Um, it's free to try, so you can download it. Um, it has this demo mode. It gives you this little panel that makes you wait five seconds and says, please buy me. Um, but after 60 days, after the demo expires, it never stops working. When the 60-day demo expires, uh, it's only $60 to buy. That's for a, a non-commercial and small business license. And what they mean by that is um, if you make more than $20,000 with it, then you should upgrade to the uh, commercial license, and that's $225. So even when you're on the sort of higher end of its pri price spectrum, um, it's still a lot more affordable than a lot of other editing software out there. And also, there's no sort of copy protection. There's no iLock. Um, so you're never without your software when you need it. You can be away from your main computer, you can download it um, on the go and still have access to all of your tools. Um, and that's actually one of the um, things that I haven't mentioned in some of my other um, workshops is that there's actually a way to do what they call a portable install, which if you pay close attention, I'm actually going to be doing this um, when we install Reaper together. I'm going to be doing a, a portable install. And this is a way of um, basically you can put it on a thumb drive. Uh, I even have a copy of it in my Dropbox. And that way I can just um, have it whenever I need it, need it. There's some other like sort of practical re reasons when it comes to editing radio that I think Reaper is particularly strong. Um, and uh, one of the things that I often say is it sounds better. And, you know, a lot of times engineers will talk about different programs sounding better. And I think that's usually pretty much bullshit. Um, but in this case, what I mean is in Reaper, it has the ability to do automatic crossfades. So when you're doing dialogue editing, and when you're, especially if you're just starting out editing, um, it's set up, and I have my configuration set up to use this automatic crossfade feature, which means that your edits actually have a much uh, lower chance of having sort of glitches and clicks and things like that. Um, so it's something that I've seen in the people that I've worked with, people's editing skill actually seems to advance just almost overnight when they're using Reaper because of this feature. Um, the editing workflow is also particularly helpful for radio, um, especially when you're doing um, projects with lots of tracks. Um, and part of that has to do with a feature called Ripple, which is sort of like um, it's sort of like shuffle mode in Pro Tools. But uh, in this case, Reaper allows you to look at the whole project almost as if it were a single piece of tape. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that when we get into the um, workshop. Um, it reads basically every audio file format I've ever thrown at it, which is not true for most other audio programs. Um, and also it does it natively, meaning it doesn't have to uh, like take an MP3 and then turn it into a wave. Um, that's something that Pro Tools does. Um, and you know, by going from MP3 to wave, you're not like gaining any quality in doing that. You're actually just getting a bigger file size. So by being able to read these audio file formats natively, um, you're able to do the editing directly from an MP3 or a, a you know M4A or you know, AAC or like any of these other formats, OGG, FLAC, um, uh, even really old audio formats tend to work pretty well in Reaper. So um, that is a huge advantage in my opinion. Um, it also just has some other features which I'll be demonstrating, which help with project management and organization and collaboration. Um, and I'll be showing you how I try to take advantage of those as well. Um, it has unlimited tracks. So um, unlike Pro Tools, uh, it maxes out at 128 tracks until you uh, buy Pro Tools Ultimate, which is like $2,000 up from 600. So you don't have those same kind of limitations in Reaper. Um, and then um, for people who use a lot of plugins, Reaper has this really cool way of distributing the CPU power of plugins. Um, so basically it's only 
running the plugins in the moment that it needs them. Um, so the plugins aren't like running all the time. And as a result, you're able to use a lot more of them and have you know more interesting filters and, and do cooler things to your mix uh, as a result. Um, and, uh, and things that I am now comfortable doing in Reaper, like if I try to do those same kinds of things in Pro Tools, the system just grinds to a halt. Um, so that's really cool. And then um, the biggest thing that I'm going to leave you with today also is this template, which is sort of like my personal radio and podcast template. And uh, this is a way of organizing your session and doing some preliminary mixing. And I'm going to be talking to you about a system that will basically, if you follow it, you'll have a very consistent, um, very consistent mixes. Um, and delivering things up to the proper loudness spec um, without a lot of extra work. Um, so I'll be talking about that as well. And I wanted to just show this off early on in the session, um, in part because uh, if you have to leave or whatever uh, partway through the, the session, I just want you to know that this is available and it's built into the, um, the configuration that I'll be giving you and the way you access it um, once I give it to you is under the file menu and project templates, and then you'll have this Brendan's uh, radio and podcast template. So I'll talk more about that when we get to it. Um, and this template is actually something that uh, whenever I'm working on a new project or working with a new group of people, this is something that I'm giving to them. And uh, I've really seen how people have taken the system and, and run with it, and then they go off and do their own work. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to do today and hoping to do through this series of workshops is basically say like, hey, you all are on my team. Let me give you these tools and uh, hopefully you can take it and run with it and make great work of your own. Um, lastly, there's some more like kind of, uh, I've been calling them esoteric reasons why I like Reaper and they have more to do with like how it feels and how it makes me feel like, um, like I'm learning uh, more as an editor. It's really shaped the way that I think about the work that I do. Um, and I realize that's kind of hard to define um, but a lot of that has to do with its flexibility, which is part of what I'll be demonstrating today. Um, and the fact that it's so deep, meaning that it's so feature rich that every time I open it, there's a chance that I'll be learning something new um, or adding a new sort of bag of tricks. Um, and, uh, and a lot of those I've actually turned into, into like key commands, which I'll then show you as well. I think Hindenburg has a very a different design philosophy than, than Reaper. Um, Hindenburg is all about having a more um, sort of focused feature set, which also means that it um, does fewer things um, because it's tailored specifically to making radio. And part of why I really like Reaper is I've got all that power that I need um, when I need it. But when it comes to doing just simple work, like say cutting a two-way interview or something like that, uh, those tools kind of fade into the background. And um, so if you've never used Reaper before, some of the things that I show today might seem a little bit overwhelming at first in terms of there are like lots of menus that go uh, very deep. Um, but what I'm going to encourage you to do is just to kind of roll with it and to have some faith that once you start working with the program, um, that stuff really does sort of fade into the background. And then when you encounter situations where you want to start exploring some of those other deeper options, um, they're there for you. Um, so let me share my screen again. And I'm going to put some links in the chat. So the first thing that you're going to need, obviously, is the program itself. And I'll put the link in the chat. And if you've already installed Reaper, uh, I'm going to encourage you to uh, follow the same process uh, with everyone and update it. And updating should be just as simple as installing over your previous um, version. This is not the same thing as installing over the settings. I'll be very clear about that when we get to that point. Um, but update, update your program so uh, we're all you know, running on the same system. Um, so once you go to reaper.fm, and you hit download here, uh, you're going to see a few different options. And if you're on Windows, uh, you just go for the 64-bit version. And if you're on a Mac, um, I'm going to encourage you to use the 10.15 plus version, which is also 64-bit. Um, they do have 32-bit versions available for older computers. But um, at this point, I'm pretty confident that everyone on this workshop has got a 
computer that can use a 64-bit system. Um, and if you happen to run into problems for whatever reason, um, you can always go back and try using the 32-bit version. They have the same features. Uh, it really has more to do with um, the 64-bit version of each program runs 64-bit version of plugins. So um, that's another reason why you might consider using a 32-bit version is if you had 32-bit audio plugins, um, you can always roll back to that older version. But we're going to work with the 64-bit version today. And then if you happen to have one of those new Macs with the M1 processors, they do have uh, uh, an ARM coded version, but I'm going to suggest that we don't use that today. And the reason for that also has to do with plugins. Um, third party plugins, by and large, are not coded for the M1 Max yet. Um, so at whatever point in the future that is the case, you can always go back here and um, change to the M1 version. But the 10.15 plus version will work on your Mac. Um, so uh, let's go with that one. The next thing that I'm going to have you download is this, which is the SWS extension. And the SWS extension is a program that runs sort of inside Reaper seamlessly. Uh, and it adds a bunch of extra functionality that isn't built into Reaper by default, but allows us to do some really cool things. Um, and I'll point that out when we get to it. Um, but uh, just to sort of spoil a little bit, one of the things is automatic loudness normalization. Um, so if you're an engineer and if that, um, if that term means something to you, uh, this is part of why we want to install this. And um, the SWS plugins actually are a little bit complicated to install on the Mac side. The PC side has, uh, by and large, been a very smooth process. Um, so I'm going to be demoing installation on the Mac side. And if you have a Mac, um, Rather than trying to install this immediately, uh, I'm going to just ask you to, to wait for a minute and then we'll walk through it step by step um, so you can follow along and hopefully uh, if there are any issues, we can catch them as we go. And then I'll also have you download this third party plugin, which is the Ulean loudness meter. And this is actually not something that we need for my system to work. But it's a really handy plugin if you don't already have it. Um, it's a way of basically graphing the loudness of mixes over time, um, and it's free. So uh, install that as well if you have um, Windows. You can get the Windows version. If you have the Mac, you get the Mac version. Oh, and by the way, if any of you happen to have Linux, uh, there is a Linux version of both Reaper and uh, the SWS plugins as well. And I will just trust that if you're using Linux, you know which version to get. Um, I'll also be sending you my configuration file in a minute, um, but I'm going to hold off on that until the moment that we need it. Uh, so for the beginning, let's just start with installing um, installing Reaper and the SWS plugins. So I'm going to do this along with you. I'm going to download the 10.15 version since I'm on a Mac. I should also say uh, that if you are running Mac operating systems, Catalina or Big Sur, uh, there is a high likelihood that we're going to run into a security error problem, and I'll walk through how we solve that as well. Um, that has to do with how the Mac operating system now requires notarization from um, third-party developers, um, and the SWS developers don't yet have that notarization. So um, I've talked with them, and they are looking into that. They're going to be getting it. Um, but in the meantime, it means that our installation is, is just a little bit more complicated. So I'm also going to get the x64 version for Mac, since that's what I'm running. And then I'm going to download the Mac version here. Now, if you're a PC user, you can just download and install all these exe files. You can run all the defaults, um, and it should just work. Um, again, I'm going to walk through the installation on the Mac side. Um, but the PC side, you can just run them and um, stand by while we finish up with the Mac installation. All righty, close this for a moment. So the first thing that we're going to do is go to our downloads directory and open up Reaper. So you'll hit agree. And once the DMG opens, you'll get a panel like this. And um, 
I'm going to do this a little bit differently. Like I said, I'm going to do what's called a portable install. But for everyone else, just drag and drop the Reaper 64 right here into your applications folder like so. And let go of it. And that will do uh, what you need it to. Um, for people who want to learn about this portable install, what I'm doing here is I've got a blank folder. And I'm going to copy Reaper into this blank folder. And then um, I'm going to add this one extra file. Where is it? I just had it here. Ah, yes. This is actually just a blank text file that uh, I've renamed Reaper INI. And basically what this says is uh, it tells the application install the program in this folder instead of installing it deeper into your system. Um, and that way, this portable install basically exists completely inside that folder. Um, which means I can put it on a thumb drive or I can put it in Dropbox or whatever and um, take my whole system with me. All right, so again, you are going to put it in the applications folder, um, but uh, I'm going to do it this way. The next step that we're all going to do together is we are going to launch Reaper for the first time. So yes, I want to open it. Um, and it's going to scan your plugins if you have plugins. Uh, if, if you do have third-party plugins, let it go through that whole process. I'm going to get a bunch of errors, and I'm actually going to cancel the plugin scan for now. Um, but if you have plugins, uh, I recommend just hanging tight and letting it uh, go through that, that process. Um, you'll also get this little window popping up. You have to select an audio device. And you're gonna, you can actually say either yes or no at this point. I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to recommend that you select the default system settings on the Mac side. And what this means is uh, rather than telling Reaper, uh, if you have like a third party USB audio device or whatever, you can tell it to run through that device. But um, I have it on the default system settings. And that way I can go up here where I change my audio device uh, settings and I can hold down option and then I can independently select from the system which audio drivers I want to be using. And so that way Reaper will just follow whatever uh, your system's using. Okay, so Reaper's gonna pop up this little window saying um, Reaper is not free, because it's not free. Uh, and then you're gonna hit still evaluating. And so at this point, you've got the base program installed. And here's where things get a little bit tricky on the Mac side. So. Let's all do this together, and I'm going to go through it kind of slowly. Um, we're going to go up to Options, and then scroll down to Show Reaper Resource Path in Explorer Finder. And this is going to open up a folder that's basically uh, deep in your system. It's a hidden folder. Um, and this is sort of the, um, the, the guts, the engine room, getting under the hood of Reaper. Um, and this is where a lot of the presets and some other just sort of behind the scenes kind of stuff exist. Um, so it should be a folder called Reaper that'll pop up like this. And in it, there should be a bunch of folders, but the one we're looking for is called user plugins. So we're going to open up user plugins. And uh, if this is your first time running Reaper, it's going to be blank. Um, and this is where we go to the SWS installation. So I'm going to open up from my downloads directory, SWS, the DMG. I'm going to say agree. And then instead of doing this, this will not work. You can't just drag and drop here. Instead of doing that, you're going to drag and drop this reaper sws.dylib file into the user plugins folder like that. So at this point, if you have uh, an older operating system before Catalina, you can just restart Reaper. Um, and you should now have the SWS install SWS extensions installed. Um, so I'm going to do that. But for anyone who has Big Sur or Catalina, I'm going to walk you through what that's going to look like. So um, I'm going to close Reaper. And I'm going to 
open up my Reaper. In this case, it's going to be in your applications folder, but um, I'm going to reopen the program. And because I'm not going to have this security error and it's going to work for me, I will now have this extensions menu bar that didn't exist beforehand. So that's how you know you've got it installed successfully. Now, if you had one of the security errors, you're going to want to go to the Apple and System Preferences here, and then Security and Privacy. And then um, you want to go to the General tab up here. And then you should have something down here that says uh, there's an unidentified developer, uh, SWS, DYLib, something like that. And you want to allow it. So you, you're going to hit the lock there, type in your password. And then you should be able to approve it and say, this is an OK file. So do that and then restart your Reaper. If you're already a Reaper user and you've been using your own configuration for a while, um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to back up Reaper sort of in the state that it's in right now. And actually, I'm going to ask everyone to do this together because it's good practice and it will give you a sense of um, this is the kind of thing that you'll want to be able to do in the future. So um, just to back everything up in its current state, we're going to go options. Show uh, preferences, <laughs> options and preferences. And um, you'll see that Reaper has a ton of preferences, which is part of why it's so customizable. Um, and this can also seem rather intimidating. Although I do want to draw your attention to just down in the bottom, there's this little find box. So um, let's just say I was trying to look up a setting about backups. I can actually do a search for the word backup and it will. Um, spot me to every instance where backup is mentioned in the preferences. And Reaper does this kind of thing actually throughout its whole program. So um, this is a really handy way, if you don't know, if you're looking for something, of being able to kind of figure it out on your own. Um, but in this case, what we're going to do is we're actually going to be saving our, um, our current version of Reaper. So to do that, we're going to go all the way up to General here, the very top. And then you'll see these two buttons, Import Configuration and Export Configuration. So we're going to go to Export Configuration. And uh, let's just check all of these boxes. These are all the different things about Reaper that one could save. So if you've been using Reaper for a long time, you want to save all of these things. So that way, you can always go back to the exact way that your Reaper was configured before we did any of this. So again, you're going to go to Preferences general and export configuration and check all the boxes and then once you've got that you can hit save um, and this is going to save into that resource directory uh, but i always try to name it something kind of memorable so I, like i'll call it default configuration and then the date and then hit save. And then it's going to save all those files into a single file. And uh, for those of you who are just interested in how the sort of the behind the scenes works, that file now exists in that resource directory under configurations. So now we're going to do kind of the opposite of, of that. Um, and we're going to do import configuration. So you'll do import configuration and then navigate to your downloads directory. Oh, I haven't given you the file yet. How about I give you the configuration? Because you're going to need that. OK, so here's the link to the configuration file. So you can download that to your downloads directory. And just to back up here, we're going to go to import configuration, navigate to your downloads directory. And then we're going to find that file that I just gave you in the chat, Brendan Baker's Reaper configuration, with, and hit open. And it's going to say, importing this configuration will require Reaper to restart. That's OK. Let's hit OK. 
And then you're going to get a window kind of like this. And so just make sure all these boxes are checked. And uh, hit import. And so this is going to be what changes the way that Reaper looks and feels. It's going to change the key configurations. Um, it's going to change the layout a little bit. Um, and I'll walk you through what, uh, what those changes I'm are. Sorry. Okay, so um, I just imported the configuration and now you can see that my Reaper looks pretty different. Um, and if you're familiar with Pro Tools, you'll notice that it has a layout that's more reminiscent of Pro Tools. So you've got like a tracks list here and something that's like a clips list here. And I'll talk about all these things in more detail in a moment. I am going to just start talking about this configuration and why I think it's cool. Um, but to do that, I'm actually going to hop over to another version of Reaper that I have sort of preloaded. And this is actually one of the kind of fun things about Reaper uh, that you can't do with other editing programs is you can have multiple versions, multiple instances of it running uh, on different parts of your computer at a time. Uh, you can't do that in Pro Tools. Um, so uh, so this is my sort of pre-configured version. Um, and uh, I'll just open a new project tab so, uh, so it looks like what you're seeing. And that actually brings me to my first big difference between Pro Tools and Reaper is that you can have these project tabs. So you can very quickly jump between you know, different programs, including, in this case, this is what the Wolverine project, uh, one of our episodes looked like. So a really big session. Um, and you can very quickly uh, also copy and paste things from one session to another session. Um, Mikhail in the chat asks, can you copy and paste between different versions of Reaper? I think, I think you met the two different instances of Reaper uh, loading. And in my experience, yes, you can do that. Um, and that's, that's pretty cool. So I've actually had uh, projects where I've had like, um, working on a cut down of an edit on one, and then um, I'm moving uh, moving stuff from one project to another project across different um, instances of the application. I don't do that so much anymore now because of this tab thing. Uh, they've had tabs for a long time, but the I don't see as much of a need to do it. I guess it would be handy if you had a workflow where it would be helpful to see like two waveforms at the same time, um, but it, it can work. Um, you'd have to do that portable install kind of thing, um, but it can work. Alrighty, so let's uh, let's get into it a little bit. Um, I'm going to send you some test audio here, so we can just um, work with this all together. I'm going to send you some music, and I'm going to put this in the chat. Here's some music, and here's a voice, and uh, I'm just going to go to my downloads directory and drag and drop the voice and music into the tracks or into Reaper directly. It's just drag and drop like that. You don't need to go to import or anything like that. It's all drag and droppable. Oh, um, and actually you're gonna see something slightly different on my end. Uh, you're gonna see that I'm having these colored waveforms. Let me talk about that uh, uh, really quickly. I didn't intend to have this on. Um, by default, you're going to have normal peaks, which is this is kind of what you're probably used to for most editing software. Uh, Reaper has this extra mode, which I've turned off by default on the configuration, but I'll tell you about because it's kind of handy. Um, and that's what uh, we call spectral peaks. So this is the, the waveform that Reaper calculates for the audio software. But if you go to um, option, and peaks display mode, you'll see there's some other things that you can do. So one is show spectral peaks. And what this does is it colors the waveform um, different colors based on whether it's a trebly sound or a bassy sound. So based on the frequency of, of the sound, you're getting a different color. And this can actually be really handy, especially with dialogue editing, um, because you can see the different parts of sound. Like you can see what a different vowel sound looks like. You can see what an S vowel sound looks like. And if you've done dialogue editing for a while, you kind of already might have some intuitive sense about what a different waveform looks like in terms of its amplitude for sounds. But this actually lets you see the spectral content, lets you see the frequencies of the sounds as well. So like 
similar type sounds are going to have similar type colors. Your, your, so that's kind your, of in the same tonality. Um, I guess I'm pretty monotone there. Um, out. And then like uh, noisier sounds like S's and stuff will be colored, usually a darker color. Sure. Just a little. Yeah. So things that have more, more noisy sounds are usually black or pop. So this can be really handy for dialogue editing. And the reason I have it turned off is it takes a little bit longer for Reaper to calculate that information the first time that you import a file. So um, I've turned it off and I haven't made this a, a focus of my configuration, um, but I'm telling you about it now because I forgot to turn it off on my own version. Um, by the way, since I'm showing you this, you can also go to options, peak display mode, and show as a spectrogram too. So if you've edited an isotope RX, you can actually see sound in this way too. So this is sort of like a, a time on this side and then frequency on the Y axis. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device driver. And if you've never used a spectrogram before, you can actually start to learn how to read it. Like you can see that this is a breath probably right here and, and right here. Uh, and this is going to be something kind of noisy, like an S. More S's right here. It sounds like smooth. <laughs> so you can really start to read these images as if, um, uh, almost as, as if it's a musical score. But, um, oh, and then also you can, um, again, options, peak display mode. You can look at them side by side too. So you can see the relationship between the waveform, which you're probably familiar with, and the spectrogram. And there actually is a way of doing some very uh, basic spectral editing, the kinds of things that you would do in the Isotope RX editor. It's not nearly as advanced as Isotope RX, um, but you can actually like hide different parts of the spectrum for engineers who are into going uh, into that kind of way of working. But for now, let's just go to normal peaks um, because uh, things will load faster and um, it's just a little less complicated. Um, you'll also notice that when you import sound into Reaper, I'm going to just show you my downloads directory. Wherever you're pulling, where, whenever you import a file from, from Reaper, it's going to add this folder, this peaks folder. And this is uh, the waveform data. So when Reaper scans the audio file and you know does the calculation to make the waveform, this is where those things are saved. Um, when we save the project, uh, I have Reaper set up to move all of that data into the the project folder, and I'll walk through that whole process in a little bit. Um, but I, I mention it now to say that um, you'll probably start to see these peaks folders pop up on your computer. You can delete them, um, but what that means is whenever you reload your program, Reaper is going to take a little extra time to calculate that data. And if you don't delete them, um, then Reaper will open faster or your project will open faster. And for the power users, there actually is a way in the preferences, um, if you do a search for uh, peaks, they're called peaks, uh, not waveforms. Um, you can tell it to uh, store all of these peaks into one central location on your computer if that's how you'd prefer to work. I don't do it that way, in part because I'm collaborating with people on Dropbox and I want to have all that data like ready to go on Dropbox. Um, so if someone that I'm working with imports a file and they calculate the peaks information, then I have access to it immediately and vice versa. So that's why I don't do it that way. Um, but just to point out that this is something that you can customize on your own if you don't like that way of working. So I've got my voice here. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper. And then I've got music as well. And this is just a piece of music that I made a while ago. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what makes Reaper sort of different from Pro Tools, just on a very basic level. The first thing that you'll notice if you've ever used Pro Tools before is that um, in Pro Tools, you have mono and stereo tracks and you can't cross them. You can't take mono information and put it on a stereo track or vice versa. And I can just sort of um, synthesize that really quick by, so pretend this is a mono file right here. 
I couldn't do something like this. I couldn't mix mono and stereo. And you can do that in Reaper. So that's really nice. Um, you can also, for people who are really doing audio production, um, you can put MIDI and audio on the same tracks, which sounds kind of weird, but actually does work in a cool way. Um, so the important thing to know is that tracks are tracks. You don't have to specify whether it's mono or stereo or anything. You just put the, the item, in this case, um, in Pro Tools, this would be called a clip, or uh, if you've been using Pro Tools for a long time, you might call this a region. Um, but uh, in Reaper speak, this is called an item, and that will be important for reasons that uh, will become clear in a little bit. But um, whenever I move an item around, um, not only can I move it freely across different tracks, but let's say I don't have a new track below. If I just pull it down, it's making a new track for me. So that's another kind of nice thing. I just delete that. You'll also notice that when I put a file in, if it's the first file on the track, then the track is named with the same name as the name of the file that I put in. So it automatically called this demo voice and demo music. It's kind of handy. So let's just talk about some of the, the tool approaches to Reaper. So I'm going to actually pop over to Pro Tools just for a minute and um, mention that when you're editing in Pro Tools, if you've used Pro Tools before, Pro Tools is based around tools. So you select the tool that you want to use, and then that tool does different functions on the waveform. So in this case, there's a trim tool, which trims the edges of a region. There's a select tool, which lets you select or edit or delete or make, you know, whatever. Um, and then there's a grabber tool, which uh, lets you move things around. So let's just say I made an edit here and an edit here. Um, I can move things around with the grabber tool. And then also there's this multi-tool, which is these tools linked. And this creates basically a contextual tool where if you hover over different parts of the region, the tool does different things. Um, and I should say that when I'm working in Pro Tools, I'm always automatically switching between these different modes. And that's how, that's, that's how Pro Tools works best for me. I actually hate using the multi-tool in Pro Tools. And that's because when, it, when I have to zoom in, close to the end of a region, it's actually really finicky about like when it turns from one tool to the next. And if you're doing any work close to the end of a region or end of a clip, uh, it actually, I find it very frustrating. So I say all that to mention that in Reaper, you have a multi-tool type approach. Um, but unlike Pro Tools in Reaper, I actually find that the, it works really well, that it's super sensitive and that I'm not running into those same kinds of weird glitchy behaviors that I encounter in Pro Tools. Um, and I should also say that this is not how Reaper is set up out of the box. So this is one of the things that is built into my current configuration is that I've set up Reaper to function the same kind of way that it works in Pro Tools. So let me just run through what that is. So uh, again, it's a multi-tool-like approach, meaning that it's contextual, and depending on where you put your mouse, it's going to do different things. So the first thing to know is that if you click and drag from the bottom of the region, or bottom of the item, that's how you're going to move it. And if you click and drag from the top, you're going to get a selection. And this is the same as it is in Pro Tools. So I can do my edit. Um, I can also delete it and that'll work. Um, if I go up to the corner and get a fade, make a fade that way from both sides, from the top corner. Um, but unlike Pro Tools, I can do some extra things to this fade. So uh, I can right click on it and then pick different fade types. I could do a purely linear fade. I could do uh, an S fade, but also I can take a more simple fade, like a linear fade, and then hold down Command and bend it. So I can start shaping the fade directly from the item in this really intuitive way. I really love that. So um, we'll get into talking about volume automation in a little bit and like drawing volume points and stuff like that. But if you wanted to do any of your fades directly on your item, which um, I do often, especially for like, um, fading in long pieces of music or something like that, uh, this is how you could do that and have an extra level of control over your fades. So this actually, all in this fade uh, discussion, brings up a bunch of important points about Reaper. Um, 
One is that in Reaper, you can right click on almost anything, almost any part of the interface, almost any part of uh, whether it's an item, whether it's um, in the mixer, whether it's, uh, you know, um, whether it's on the, the track panel on the side. And if you right click, you'll get more information. Um, it'll give you more options. So if you ever want to go a level deeper, if you ever want it to do something that you think it should do, but maybe you don't know how, try right clicking on it because um, you'll get a bunch of extra options. And um, in my experience, I would say like nine times out of 10, your answer is going to be somewhere in that second click version, that second click option. Um, the other thing is that, and this is also has to do with how I've set up Reaper, um, but it's true also in the default configuration that the, the modification keys, command, option, control, shift, will change uh, what uh, change your function in different ways. Um, I haven't mentioned this yet, but um, when I do these different keys on the bottom, these different modifier keys, they're going to be different on Windows versus Mac. Um, so command, like if to bring up the mixer in Pro Tools is command equals. On Windows, that would be control equals. So you'll just have to translate on the fly if you're on a Windows machine. But this symbol is the command symbol. Then this symbol right here, this is your option key, and that's the Alt key in Windows. And then this is Control, which is like the uh, Start key or the Windows key on Windows. Um, and then Shift. So between Shift, Control, Option slash Alt, and then Command or Control in Windows, these are your main mouse modifiers. Um, so you'll see me do lots of different things with that. Um, but I'll be calling out the Mac version. That doesn't just have to do with key commands, like whether you're doing Command B versus Command E or you know whatever. It actually is also like if you click on something. So for just an example, I'm going to make an edit here. Uh, if I shift and drag, I can slip the content within an edit. And this is something you can't do in Pro Tools. Um, and I find this to be super helpful uh, both for like getting music timing down exactly uh, and also uh, also sometimes for dialogue editing. Like if I've got a long uh, piece and I want to sort of change whether I have a, a breath at the end of the thing or not, like you can actually um, play with it not just by trimming the ends but by actually sliding within a pre-set item. So that can be really powerful in uh, the right situation. You can also option drag to stretch. This is like more of a sound design-y kind of thing. This wouldn't be like an everyday radio function, but... And that you're hearing this successfully without... And you can also option, you can time compress it, make it faster. You're hearing this successfully without... Uh, and the important thing to know about this is it's non-destructive. So unlike Pro Tools, um, if you use the command to mode in Pro Tools, uh, this time compression and expansion would be writing a new file each time you do it. Um, and you'd have to undo it in order to get back to your original speed. In this case, it's totally non-destructive. And that's actually a really big part of my editing philosophy in Reaper um, is I try to do everything as non-destructively as possible. Um, and this will come up a little bit later when we're talking about um, sort of the equivalent to audio suite in Reaper. Um, uh, but I, I will show you a way to do various processes to files without having to create new, um, new data, basically. So it's always referencing the original um, interview file or music file, wherever you're pulling from. Um, and then if you double click an item, you'll get this properties window. And this is actually where I can um, reset my playback rate. So I, I just made it a little bit faster. I can just change that back to where it was, which is the playback rate should be one. And then it will go back to where it used to be. And um, for those of you who are into doing more sound designy stuff, you can actually also make it so it stretches more like tape. So right now I have it set to preserve the pitch when you're stretching that out. So um, you know if I stretch it really long, hearing this successfully without you know, it's going to try to keep the same pitch, but I can actually turn that off and treat it more like analog tape. And that you're hearing this successfully without... So that can be fun to play around with too. You can, you know... You're hearing this successfully without... Again, a more sound designy kind of thing, but um, 
helpful when and if you need to use it. But um, that's probably a, not a normal use case. There are other things that you'll be doing a lot more frequently with this properties window. And the first is if you double click any item, by default in blue, it's taking you to this, the take name. And this is how you can label your tape. So uh, you can start saying like Brendan's voice. And then you can see how it's named Brendan's voice up here. And simultaneously on the side, this is, uh, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but this is the project and media effects bay. I have it set up to work kind of like the Pro Tools clips list so you can see that the Brendan's voice file is there and you can actually do searches. So if you had a really big project with a lot of files, you can do a search for Brendan and then it will show you this is where the item Brendan's voice is and you can even pull it in that way. So this can be a really powerful way of keeping um, track of your tape when you are uh, when you're logging it. This is actually a thing that um, I think was really made popular for folks who worked at Radiolab. Um, they would uh, transcribe their tape sort of clip by clip in Pro Tools, and you can do the same kind of thing in Reaper. And in fact, um, in some of my Love and Radio projects, this is actually the last project I did on Love and Radio, but I do a similar kind of thing here um, where I will make a note about what, you know, a particular section of tape uh, is about. Um, other things about this properties menu, I just think that the coolest thing about this is that it's basically all the data about a given item in or that you would need in order to make, to know where that piece of audio is in space and time. So like, if you look through, you can see, uh, this is its position in the session. This is how long it is, um, whether it has a fade or not. Um, and then really helpfully where it starts uh, in reference to the beginning of the file. So if I've got like an hour long interview, something that I do uh, very frequently, especially if I've got really well logged tape and I know that like, I, let's say I know that there's a moment at, uh, you know, 34 minutes and 50 seconds um, that I really like, I can always make a copy of an item, click the properties menu, and actually type that time code right in and say, okay, I want to go to 34 minutes, 50 seconds, hit apply. And now this whole chunk of tape is moved to a, a new location. It's still referencing the same file, um, but it's now referencing that point that in my in a log that I want to um, that I want to reach. So that can be a really powerful use of that properties window as well. Okay, before we get much deeper with key commands and stuff like that, um, I would like to just talk about the action list. Uh, this is something that I've never seen in any other program, um, but is incredibly powerful and central to how Reaper works. So up here at the very top where it says actions, you're gonna see show action list. And this is basically a list of every possible thing that Reaper can do in the whole program and whatever key command it's mapped to. Uh, so you can actually use this in a couple different ways. The first way is you can click find shortcut. And then if I do a particular key command, um, so for example, in Pro Tools, editing to make a slice or a split, it's command E. If I type in command E, you can see that, okay, this is what command E does. It's uh, splitting the items. And it's actually doing that in a customized way because that's sort of how I've programmed it. Um, but uh, this is a really good way of, as you're learning the program, you can kind of reverse look up different functions and see what different keys do. Um, so uh, that's one way of using it. The other way of using it is you can start to, the same way in the um, preferences that you could search for different things, you can do a search for a certain type of function. So let's say I wanted to make a key command that had something to do with fades. I can type in fade, and not only will it, it'll start to narrow down my options and only give me the, op the, the, um, the actions that have something to do with fades and I can get more uh, detailed with it. So I can, I can do fade in item. And as I keep adding more uh, data to my search, 
it will start to narrow down the options that are relevant to me. You can also change your own key commands. This is how I start to set things up to work more like Pro Tools. Um, so uh, as some of you might know, Pro Tools, you can do an edit with Command E, but also the B key will, will do an edit. Um, and so I can either do that by searching for it or it's just right there. But I can add a new key. So like I could say, what if I wanted it to be a Shift B? I can do that. Um, in this case, I have it um, mapped to another function. So it's saying, are you sure you want to override it? But this is how you start building up. And you can make your own key commands based on the kinds of things that you're doing most frequently. So I've set up my whole key commands based around a more of a Pro Tools workflow. Um, but I wanted to talk about this action list before I get into detail on these different key commands, um, because this is how you can look it up. This is how you can change it. Also, if you are um, used to the Reaper defaults and you want to go back, uh, this is how you do it. You click at uh, right down here where it says key map. Um, you can restore all the key bindings to their factory defaults. Um, so I'm going to recommend that you don't do that for now, uh, but uh, that's how you do it. One last thing about key commands. Um, if I go to help and key bindings and mouse modifiers, it will open up something in my browser, which is basically all the shortcuts um, as they're currently configured. And this is based on like whatever you set up Reaper to do. So this is based on my current key commands. Um, and this will tell you how to use my entire system. Um, but as you start to uh, adapt and add things or change things, um, that'll be reflected in this as well. So that's something pretty cool. I mentioned that I'm having the set of key commands that are inspired by Pro Tools. So uh, most simply, Command E will do a, a split or a cut, an edit, Command E edit. Uh, and then the B key will also make an edit. But I've actually done something slightly customized to the B key, um, and I've turned it into uh, what I call a hover edit. So with a traditional edit, and the way that most audio editing software works is you have to click to the place that you want to make an edit, and then you make that edit, right? But I have it set up with the B key where you don't have to click. You can just hover your mouse over something and just make a split like that. And this is really handy uh, if you've got like a, you know, a big audio file and you're just starting to make like rough cuts and you're like, okay, I know I need to do a cut there. I know I need to do a cut there. You can just do that super quickly, but it also works while you're playing. Here's just a little bit of test audio so to make sure that you make as many cuts as audio I want device. Um, and Reaper keeps going. Um, and where that's relevant to the action list, and this is actually one of the things, if you have any sort of um, programmer type mind, you can do some really powerful stuff. So let's just look up the, the B key that I was doing earlier. You can see that it's a custom command, something that I've built. And if you go to edit action, it'll bring up this other window, which will show you that this hover command that I've made is actually the combination of three separate actions, but done in a certain sequence. So on this side, you've got all the possible things that Reaper can do searchable. Um, and then on this side, you can start to layer them in and sequence them in and um, basically teach Reaper to do things that it didn't originally, that it wasn't originally designed to do. Um, or I guess another way of saying it was Reaper is designed in a way where it's letting you kind of um, almost like Legos put things together and uh, you know do things and make key commands that are not built in by default. Um, and that goes for almost anything in the program. So through this process uh, and through working with the program for a number of years, this is how I've been able to basically build up um, a whole way of working that's sort of like Pro Tools Plus, um, so it's you know based off these Pro Tools key commands, but does other things. So that hover edit that I was talking about, it's not just on the edit. Um, if you've worked with Pro Tools before, you'll know that um, the A, S, and the D and G keys do um, various things editorially. So uh, the A key, for example, means um, 
cut from the or trim from the end of uh, the left end of an item to an edit like that. That's what A does. Meanwhile, S does the, the same thing, but from the right side like that. Um, and I also have that set up to hover. So you can click and use the A and S keys the way you would normally do on Pro Tools, but you don't have to click. You can just hover it and um, make the edits that way. So it's a time-saving kind of thing. Um, and then similarly with the D and G keys, that has to do with fades. So I can do a fade and a fade. Um, and it happens super fast. Um, let's say also that I was doing a crossfade between two things. The F key will do that. So um, it's you have to make a time selection across two edits and then hit F and it'll automatically make a crossfade. And you can edit this crossfade in the same way as uh, you know you would intuitively try to edit. You can also change the shape in the same way. Um, you can do all the same things that you would be doing on the side of an item as well. Okay. Um, before I get into talking too much more about key commands, I'll talk about navigation. In Pro Tools, you'd zoom in and out with R and T keys, and that works here, R and T. Um, by default, Reaper, it's the up and down keys. So that works as well. Also, um, so something that I've added in addition to the R and T are four and five. So right above the R and T keys, if R and T is zooming in and out on the horizontal plane, uh, four and five are zooming in and out on the vertical plane. So you've got all of your zoom keys in that same general area. And this is actually a, a big part of my, um, my approach here is that, um, I like to have one hand on the keyboard at all times and one hand on the mouse at all times. And as a result, you'll see that, um, and this is based off of Pro Tools, that the left side of the keyboard has most of the editorial controls. So in theory, I can do almost everything I need it to, to do with the one hand and then the other hand on my mouse. Another way that I really like getting around, especially big pro uh, projects, is I'm just gonna switch to a different tab here to demonstrate this holding down the command key on um, Mac, and that would be the control key on Windows. So if you hold down command, and then if you have a scroll on your mouse, um, especially if you have a, a left and right scroll, this is another great way of zooming. So um, I can horizontally zoom in and out by holding down command and then scrolling both up and down. And that's how I do most of my navigation. This also works if you have a trackpad too. Um, and by the way, if you have a trackpad and you haven't turned on its sort of secondary click or right click function um, in system preferences, I really recommend doing that. Um, but that way you can use two fingers to do a, a right click uh, on your trackpad. Um, you can also command right drag, which will navigate around the session that way. It's sort of like almost as if you grabbed the background of the the the, the session and started moving it around. So that's command and then right click dragging. Um, and then you'll also see at the top, I've got this navigator, um, which is sort of like a map of the entire session. And you can navigate by dragging the navigator around like so. You can also like shift and draw. So like, let's just say I wanted to focus on these pink tracks. I can just draw around them. And that way I'm zooming exactly to that part of the session, which pink in this case happens to be my sound, sound effects. Um, but then I could also shift and drag around the, uh, the dialogue. And then I can just see my whole dialogue that way. So those are all different ways of being able to navigate around um, the session. And again, I, I tend to like the command mouse way of a scroll, a command scroll way of doing it rather than the key commands. But I, I go back and forth between also using key commands to do it depending on, depending on my instinct, I guess. So now let's talk just about general layout. And um, basically, I'm going to talk about all the different parts that you're seeing on the screen, what they are. And then I'll also give a, a 
tour of this part of Reaper, um, which includes some extra things that I've added into it. And I'll talk about those as well. So the first thing to know about the layout here is that it's completely modular. What I mean by that is, um, so this tracks list, for example, I can take it and move it to, oh, I've got to get a hold of it, stand by. I can pop it out as its own thing by right clicking and undocking it, or I can redock it back into, uh, into the layout. So uh, docking is basically a way of sticking any one of these panels to the interface, and you can also pop it out of the interface too. Um, so by uh, default, I have the mixer docked. So whenever you have the mixer go up and down with command equals, it's part of the interface. But if I wanted to go to a more Pro Tools way of working it, I could right click and then uncheck dock in mixer. And now I've got this floating mixer that I can um, you know, put in another, if I have two screens, I can have the mixer in one screen and then the arrange session view uh, in this other screen. So that can be really handy. Um, but the way that I work, I tend to keep things docked and then show and hide things as I use them. So um, right now I'm closing the mixer. Uh, and then this is what I was trying to demonstrate earlier. There, as you expand and contract uh, the edges of these different panels, you can make them, you know, fit as much space as you need them to. You'll also see these tabs and you can move these tabs over to other parts of the interface. So now my track manager is on this side. Uh, let me just make this, there we go. And you can see that I've got two different tabs at this point. But I, in order to replicate that tr Pro Tools um, sort of look, I'm going to put it back here. And all this stuff you can also close. So if you go to View, you can close the Track Manager. Um, you can close the Project Media Effects Bay on the side. And especially if I'm working on a, a laptop with a small screen, this can be really handy. I can start to hide elements and just focus on the main interface and have a much more clean layout. And then when it's time for me to do things that require any of those panels, I can go deeper and um, start to, to uh, dig around. So um, bring that back. Similarly with a navigator, the navigator is also something that's totally optional. You can um, hide that. So if that's taking up too much space, you can hide it um, and get a really super clean layout if you want. Um, but I will keep it in for the time being. Um, and it's worth just sort of experimenting and seeing uh, how like moving different parts of the interface can, um, like you'll notice here on the track panel, if I start to move this inward, um, it'll start to collapse and different um, features will disappear. Similarly, if I zoom in and out, um, it'll start to show me only kind of the main elements. So you can start to, it'll, it'll dynamically scale things um, and, uh, show you more options the, the more you zoom in. So let's talk about the, the main toolbar, which is this part of the interface. I'm just going to tidy this up a little bit, make this a little bit smaller. Main toolbar. So if you mouse over this, uh, it'll give you a little hint and it will tell you what, um, what it is, so, uh, and also the key command for it. So new project open project, this is save project. So this is basic stuff. Project settings, uh, undo, this is redo. Um, and so this right here is a metronome. Um, and I have that turned off by default, but if you have it turned on, if you're doing stuff with music, that's what it sounds like. I recommend keeping it off by default because most of you probably will not be using it. Um, this is a button that I added to the main toolbar, and this is to render, like to bounce out a file. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but that's how you do it. Um, right here, this is the master fader. Um, and I have the master fader configured on the side like this. And the reason for doing that is um, you can change the size of it like so. Uh, 
I like being able to see where my levels are at from time to time. So this is like a really handy way of just being able to turn it on and off. And I'm gonna turn this down just a little bit. Um, I'll talk more about how I did that in a second. But um, you'll see there are two different types of metering. There's a blue meter and then there's a, a green meter. Um, and the green is, well, the blue is sort of like what a typical, that's like the peak meter. That's what you'd see in most other editing programs, um, including Pro Tools. But the green one is a RMS meter and it's actually a slow RMS meter configured in a way where uh, it's sort of replicating the way that LUFs work um, or loudness units. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about loudness units later on in the session, but this is a really handy way of me being able to see whether or not my levels are um, getting in the right ballpark or not. So um, this will turn the master fader on and off. And um, just like everything in Reaper, it's because it's right clickable. If I right click the master fader, um, I can put it in different places too. I can say, I want you to put it back down into the mixer or I want you to put it uh, on the left side of the mixer instead of the right side. So it's super configurable. You can pop it out in a separate window if you want. You can make it as big as you want. Um, but by default, I have it docked on the side. So that's how you change that. On the bottom row, this is a super important one. This is Ripple, which is kind of like the equivalent of slip and shuffle. And it's so important that I actually want to spend a little time talking about it. So uh, let's just wait on that for a minute and I'll come back to it. Um, right next to that, this is your groups, whether groups are turned on or off. And what that means is, and I'll just demonstrate this really quickly. So in Reaper, I can make uh, groupings of items. Um, in Pro Tools, you, you would uh, typically group tracks. This works a little bit differently. This is more like um, Pro Tools' clip group, but it um, does some other things that I think are kind of nice. So let's just say that I had this little, I'm going to uh, just make a little volume duck here, that I had this uh, bit of a voice and I want the volume to duck down momentarily while the voice is speaking. I'll talk more about how I do this in a minute, so to stand by on that. Uh, and And I want these two items to be grouped so they're always staying together no matter if I move them around the, the project or not. So I just made a little, little sort of mini assembly here. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make so sure it's talking and then I don't have this quite in the right spot yet, but, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. And then the music comes back up. So I can select these by just sort of lassoing them or it's called a marquee in Reaper, but, um, basically drawing a box over them and then doing command G. And then from that point forward, when I move them or when I move one, they'll move together. Uh, if this is turned off though, that grouping is temporarily disabled. So this is sort of like a global override or global on off switch for all of your groups in your project. Um, so by default, I'm gonna recommend that you keep this on. Um, and this is jumping ahead a little bit, but by the way, whenever I make a group like this, um, it's the one, two, three, four, fifth tab uh, in the project bay here. You can actually name that group a specific thing. So you could call it, uh, um, I don't know, like intro sequence or whatever. Um, and that way uh, you can have several different groups that are all named and you can keep track of them that way. So that can be really handy. But um, I very rarely use that. Mostly I'm just sort of grouping things and ungrouping things kind of uh, as I need them to. And ungrouping is command U. So right now things are grouped. And then if I select it and hit command U, that's ungrouping them. And now they move independently again. Okay, next to that, uh, if you're familiar with Pro Tools, this is automation follows uh, edit or follows item, follows clip. Um, so when this is turned on, I've got this automation, this volume um, that's drawn beneath the item. 
And if I move the item, I'm also moving the volume automation with it. But if this is turned off, then the automation stays put and then the item moves. So this can be a kind of dangerous thing if it's you, I, I'm gonna say like 99% of the time you're gonna wanna have this on. And then um, if there are specific moments where you've got a certain type of automation that you've drawn that like you've got a curve that you've really obsessed over and it's working really well, but you want to make the music fit differently over it, you could temporarily turn it off um, and then slide the music where you want it to go and then turn it back on. Um, but I'm gonna recommend that you keep it on all the time. Um, and there have been times when I've like forgotten to turn it back on and then things get out of alignment. Um, so uh, if you ever encounter that problem, this is how you'd fix it. Next to that is uh, the grid. So if you're doing any music-based work, this is how you'd turn the grid on and off. Um, and you'll notice that actually I have kind of a grid behind the grid. This is a trick that I got from Jeff Entman of uh, the podcast, Here Be Monsters. Um, but I have this sort of um, gray and darker gray alternating pattern, um, which is showing 10 second chunks. So uh, I can just very quickly hold something against it and know that like, okay, this is about 15 seconds. Um, and I think he actually configured his Reaper so it was like one minute because um, he was looking at things sort of more zoomed out. Um, but for me, I thought that it was more helpful to have it in 10 second increments. Um, so that's uh, that's how I've designed it. Um, next to the grid is the snap feature. So if I had my grid turned on, which chances are most of you are not going to do that, um, if I were to move an item, I feel it snapping to each one of these indentations. And by snapping, my mouse sort of like it kind of goes chunk, chunk, chunk. Let's zoom in. You can see it a little bit more. Just like bop, bop, bop. And it pops to one of those indentations. But with the grid turned off, it actually starts um, snapping to other items. And this can be really helpful for trying to line things up. Or um, I haven't given the key command for this yet, but like making a marker. Um, my command for making a marker is shift M, but it, it also, the Pro Tools, um, uh, return on the number pad or function return will also create a marker. So the same Pro Tools key command should work. Um, if I make a marker like this, I can also feel it snapping to that marker. And so especially when you've got a project with a lot of different tracks, this is a really handy way of um, making sure that things sort of uh, get lined up properly. And then this is something that I've also never seen in uh, another editing program in the same way. You notice that if I take an edit and I start moving it around, I get these guidelines on both the X and the Y axis, and those also snap. So it's really handy for um, both measuring things and also making sure that, uh, you know, especially as you start to get into more complex projects, like if you want a bunch of different sound effects to hit at the same time, or you know, ambiences or whatever it is, ambiences that you want to line up with a piece of dialogue, that that all that will happen, and it will happen with that sort of snappiness. Um, so that is very handy. Um, and if you turn it off, then it just slides without any snappiness. So I recommend turning it on. If you find the snapping annoying for whatever reason, you can turn it off. But also, like everything in Reaper, if you right click it, um, you can start to tune it and customize it in different ways and maybe make it make the snap work in a way that works better for you. Uh, next, so I'm going to leave that on, recommend keeping that on. Uh, this is the lock. This is like a global lock for all, the entire project. So when you have it on, um, you can lock basically everything in place. This is something that I very rarely use. Um, there's a different type of locking that I actually recommend that I think is more practical, which is like if you wanted to lock a particular item or clip to the timeline, you can do that with uh, Command L. So that's a slightly different thing than this lock. So point being, um, I would recommend just keeping this off and not to worry about it unless you're doing something like you're trying to lock down your project for some reason, um, then you can do it that way. But uh, Command L will toggle items being locked or not. Okay, next to that is the automatic crossfade. 
And this is the thing that I was talking about earlier, which I think really improves the sound of people's edits. So um, if I make an edit with the B key here, and if I push two, uh, if this is on, <laughs> and I push two items into each other, it automatically creates that crossfade. So uh, when in doubt, and if it, when, it, when I'm editing, I try to make sure that there are always crossfades between every edit point that I make. Um, and I get really kind of um, obsessive about this. Like this is in this um, example, you can see uh, room tone is green and then the edit is in blue. And then, so I've patched all the pauses with room tone and then there are crossfades between all the edits with room tone and all of the sort of item to item edits as well. Um, so that's constantly happening. Um, so I recommend keeping this on by default. And then if you have it off, uh, you can do more of that Pro Tools style of editing where when two items overlap, they cover each other up and then cut off whatever it's overlapping. So if I pull this region back now, uh, that bit of tape has been deleted. So just to observe it again, overlapping, letting go, and now, and that's the way that Pro Tools works. If you right click it, you can actually modify this a bit. You can um, turn off that feature that trim content behind items when editing, in which case then it's actually just sort of overlapping like that. But from my mind, that gets really confusing really quickly because um, then you have to kind of keep track of like what is behind what. Uh, and that I think is a level of complexity that I don't want to deal with. So I recommend um, keeping this on, trim content behind items when editing, which yours should be turned on by default. And I also recommend having the automatic crossfade uh, turned on, except for moments where you want to specifically do that kind of um, Pro Tools style of overlap uh, editing. Okay, um, next to that, this is your color palette. And so this uh, is a, one of the sort of main ways that I keep track of things apart from labeling tape. Um, you can color different items, different colors, you can color tracks. Um, and notice how the last thing that I clicked, whether it was a, an item or a track, will change what's happening on this color swatch. So right now it says track, that's the last thing I clicked. If I click an item, now item has, uh, that's sort of in pink. Um, and the important thing to know here is that once you color a track, you color all the items in that track. But uh, if you color an item, that overrides the track color. So item color overrides track color. And um, depending on the project, I've used color in all sorts of different ways. Um, sometimes for interviews, um, I would color like a piece of tape that I really like green and like sections of tape that I don't like, you know, red or something that I'm unsure about yellow. Um, so that's in an earlier stage of an edit, that is sometimes how I use color. Um, when I get deeper into an edit, um, let me show you on this project. I often will group a uh, subject by color. So if, if someone's talking about a certain subject, that will all get the same color. And then when they move on to the next subject, that'll get a certain color. And so you can see in this piece um, that these were sort of two related subjects. And then I had a little bit of an edit that I put just to make it make flow better. I put a little bit of that um, towards the end. So that's a nice way of keeping track of things. And then also keeping track of like your room tone. Your room tone can be a different color than your um, other items. And th that can all still reference the same file, but um, it's just referencing different parts of it. If that makes sense. This last box here. Uh, this is the notes box. And this is actually something that I think is really cool that I have not seen in any other editing program. So in Reaper, you can leave notes on just about anything. You can leave notes on uh, a whole project. So when I'm collaborating with someone on Dropbox, uh, I can set it up so it prompts the person with a note every time they open um, my last saved version. Um, and I'll demonstrate that in a little bit when I show you my template. Um, you can leave notes on a track. So if like, you, I don't know, something that like, uh, I have a harder time imagining how this would be useful, but you could just say like, uh, this track is for 
music or whatever. Um, you can leave notes that way. And just to see how this works, um, if I'm clicking that track, I'll get the note that I left on the track. But if I click on a different music track, that note disappears. So the notes appear depending on what you clicked last. I don't use that very often. The thing that I think is more helpful actually are the item notes. So let's say that uh, I was in the middle of a project with someone and we're trying to uh, figure out what music we want. I could leave notes a bunch of ways. I could leave notes in a marker. I could leave notes in an item marker. But I can also talk a little bit more about um, like, you know, this piece of music just isn't working for me. Um, and I could leave my name or whatever. Uh, and then now you've got this note icon right here. And so anyone can see that and click it and they can bring up that note or, you know, you could have kind of a running conversation about it. Um, and then the kind of cool thing is as you start to edit, um, those notes will stick with the piece. So now this piece of music is over here and I can still get that note. So that's pretty handy. Um, so as I'm starting to make more and more complicated projects, especially when I'm collaborating with people, I'll find ways of relying more and more on these text type tools uh, just so that we're having this collaborative conversation about the kinds of decisions that we're making. Uh, markers can get their own color. So that's nice. Um, and since we're talking about markers, how about I also mention, so I the, the shortcut for marker was shift M. And when you do that, it prompts you with what you want to call it. So like oftentimes I'm saying like bad edit, like I need to fix this thing. Um, and then I can move that, you know, wherever it needs to go. Um, and also kind of cool thing that when I'm in ripple mode, the markers move along with the edit as well. Um, so that's a really powerful thing. Um, so your, your markers always stay in place. There's a new feature, relatively new in Reaper, that I'm starting to use in my workflow um, that are item markers. So these are like session markers. It's kind of like what most folks are used to. But um, I can also do, in this case, it's so Shift M was the key command for a session marker, but Option Shift M will make a marker on an item itself. You can make as many of these as you want. And this can be a really handy way of like, so I know the beat drops here. So I can put a little marker there. And if I double click it, I can even name it like Q or, you know, like I wanna post an edit here. So these can be really handy ways of like making notes to self. Um, and uh, also when you're collaborating with someone, they can get a sense of what you're thinking is too. So you can like leave a marker for significant moments, whether it's in a piece. Um, this is also another way of like within uh, within your dialogue or within your interview, you could sort of make an even more nuanced version of, oh, there's this really cool cough or I don't know, I don't know laugh or something uh, that happens uh, in, a, in a region and you could leave a marker that way. Let's talk about Ripple because Ripple is very powerful. So to do this, I'm going to first just step back to Pro Tools and talk a little bit about um, how Reaper is different than Pro Tools. So in Pro Tools, you have these two types of edit modes, which are up here, and that's slip and shuffle. And when you're in slip mode and you grab a chunk of sound, you move it and it moves wherever you want it to go and kind of works the way you'd expect. And then let's just say you make some edits. Uh, in shuffle mode, what happens is if you make a deletion or an edit, the clips will snap together like that. Additionally, uh, you can also sort of flip the order of things with shuffle. Um, and that's something that you can't do in the same way in Reaper. Um, the flippiness, that, that part of it doesn't work in the same way. So let me just show you how it's different and then also in how, why I think it's actually more powerful. This box right up here, this is scrolling through three different modes. So in Pro Tools, there are two modes, just slip and shuffle. In Reaper, there are three modes. It's ripple off, which is like slip. There's ripple on per track, which is like shuffle. And then there's ripple all or ripple for the entire session. And they're represented by these three icons. So this is um, ripple off. So it functions more like slip 
so I can take a piece of sound, move it wherever it needs to go. This is ripple per track. So if I delete a chunk of sound, it's going to snap together like so. And just to make that even clearer, let's say I just deleted this whole color. That whole section gets snapped. But this is where it can be problematic because let's say that I want this music right here in, in orange to come in at a very particular time. Um, if I do uh, an edit per track like or a ripple per track, I'm also losing that timing. So to get around that, um, I go to ripple all mode. And so let's see how that functions differently. If I select this whole bit and I delete, now you can see it's deleted everything underneath that colored region. So there's an edit point right here with the music, but all of these other decisions are still in place. So when I make an edit like this in Ripple All, it's, it's treating, imagine it as if it's treating the whole session as if it were a piece of tape. So it's making that cut across the entire session. Um, and then I either have to fix this edit down here as a result, or um, I can do this. I can restretch this piece of music out and kind of rebuild my uh, uh, rebuild it that way. And I find that to be a lot faster than what you have to do in Pro Tools. So in Pro Tools, what you'd have to do is you'd have to um, take a, an, a clip of sound. You'd have to do Command Shift Enter, which also works on Reaper. Um, but that basically says select everything all the way to the end. And then depending on how you do it, you either have to uh, select all the tracks or group all the tracks in order to make that edit. So in Pro Tools, this is like a three-part move. Whereas in Reaper, it's a, just it's as simple as turning on um, the Ripple All mode. So as I've gotten to use this, I've really found that um, I'm very rarely using Ripple per track. Um, and I'm more often using just the ripple off mode and then temporarily turning on ripple all as I need it. So I can do most of the work I need to do. I would say like 95% of the work, maybe even 99% of the work just between those two modes, ripple all and turned off. Um, and the way I've been doing that lately, actually, well, let me first give you the key commands. So. Um, I have this button mapped to the one, two, and three keys. So one is ripple off, two is ripple per track, and three is ripple all. The way that I tend to work now is I keep ripple mode off, so I'm staying in that one mode, and then I'm using the command key to temporarily turn it on by command and then dragging, and that will turn it on ripple all just for that moment that I need it. So uh, if I were to drag this normally, it would just slip, right? But if I'm holding down the command key, I can just while I'm holding it down, temporarily turn on ripple all mode. And so uh, if I needed to say like, insert a new chapter to the story, that's kind of how I do it, is I would click here, make space for how, whatever I needed to insert, and that way, my music cues and all my sound design and all that um, stays linked together here. And when you are working on a really big project with multiple tracks, like so this is what the Wolverine should project uh, looks like, many hundreds of tracks, um, I don't want any of this stuff to get out of alignment. Like I put a, a ton of work into that, right? So I would use Ripple All Mode for that. Alrighty, so that is Ripple. And that alone, I think, I mean, it just, it, it works more the way that my brain thinks when I'm trying to make big edits to a piece or like if I'm mostly done with a, a story and um, I just need to make a few like minor tweaks to the dialogue, um, I can do that all super fast without having to lose any of the sound design and music that I've really labored over. Let's now talk about uh, the track control panel and the mixer control panel. So this is the track control panel all here on the side. And then the mixer control panel, when I bring up the mixer, 
This is the mixer control panel. Um, and if you can kind of imagine, uh, the track control panel is sort of like the mixer on its side. So I've got all my purple tracks here, blue tracks, orange tracks. And they have a lot of uh, the same corresponding features. So as I zoom in, remember, um, the, mo the, the, the more I expand these, the more uh, controls I get. But I, you know, I've got my mute and my solo. Um, but let me just go back to that sort of um, z really zoomed in mode. Actually, let me go onto this track since it's a little bit easier to see. So I've got my mixer here. Uh, or fader. Um, I've got my pan controls here. And by the way, these pan controls, uh, the way that they're set up by default is um, it's like a balance for left and right. Um, and then this is a width. So you can actually collapse a stereo track into something that's more mono-like um, as you get more towards the center, or you can actually reverse it. If you want to go back to the sort of way that Pro Tools does it, if you right click it, like most things, if you right click it, you get more options and you can set it up as a dual pan. And that way you can have independent control over the left and the right pans. But I prefer having the balance and then the, the width. I feel like that gives me a, a type of control that I don't normally get in other editing programs. Um, okay, so if I zoom all the way out, the very basics of the track control panel are you've got your solo, which is command S by the way. You've got mute, which I don't have any key command mapped to at the moment. Um, and then you've got your effects buttons. And so if I had plugins on the track and I'll talk more about plugins in a little bit, um, but this is how you add plugins to your mixer or add plugins to your track. Um, and this works with third party plugins. So if you have third party plugins installed um, basically, clicking FX will open up this FX panel. You can hit Add, and this is a list of all the effects that you have um, in your installed. So I can do a little search and you know find the effect that I'm looking for specifically, or I can make it more generalized and say like I'm looking for an EQ, and then it will narrow down um, all the plugins that have EQ. Um, you can also do a search by categories, so you can. Um, see like whether it's EQ or dynamics or whatever, it, you can fold them into those categories or you can have it searched by developer. So uh, it's a way of if you have a lot of plugins being able to manage that and, um, you know, and find what you're looking for. But in this case, if I just add a built in Reaper plugin, so an EQ, re EQ is their stock plugin. Um, so now that plugin is uh, on the that both you can see it there in the mixer, you can see it here, and uh, this on off button will turn on and off all the plugins that you have on that track. And so I can add like a compressor with recomp there. Um, and then also if I double click on these, it will break them out into their own panels as well. So that way you can have several different plugins at, at a time or you can just scroll through them. And so this is like a whole chain of effects, which you can save. Um, also, you can like save custom chains of effects. Uh, and uh, and they're, they're done serially, right? So it, it starts on the top and it goes, so the signal goes from the top plugin first and then from the top plugin to the next plugin and so on and so forth. Um, and then on the mixer, you can see that orange means that the plugin has been turned off whereas blue is turned on. And if I check these little boxes, I can independently turn the plugins on and off to bypass them as well. I hadn't mentioned this in any of my other sessions yet, but there's also within every plugin, regardless of whether it's a Reaper plugin or whether it's a third-party plugin, there's also a built-in wet-dry balance, um, which can be really handy for people who are doing more advanced sound design. Um, what else in the track control panel? Well, there's this in the corner. This will give you all the properties of how that track is routed. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail talking about um, sends and receives at the moment, but this is how you can set up a send and receive is basically you can say, I want signal from this one track to be routed to another track, and this is how you do it. Um, 
And if you're doing like really advanced stuff, like um, multi-channel surround stuff, instead of having a two-channel stereo track, you can have like a 64-channel surround track. So you can have up to 64 channels per track. Um, and actually, when I was doing the Wolverine podcast, we were using the system called Ambisonics, which is like a sort of a um, three-dimensional way of representing sound. So we had uh, anywhere from four to 16 channels per track um, for our sound design. Let me do the bottom row here. So this is your, for engineers, this is your phase. You can turn your phase on and off. Um, this right here is your automation panel. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but this is how you get these, um, uh, just to give you a, a demo. When I start getting into really into sound design and start automating different parameters of effects and stuff, that's what all these different lanes are. That's how you turn that on and off um, is by clicking that panel. And then these are the two plugins that I just added. And these are all the different parameters in that plugin. And then I can turn them on and off. Um, so I could like uh, turn the frequency of the high shelf and I could start automating it that way if I wanted to. Um, most often you're probably gonna be using this for volume. So, and as you can see, uh, if you click volume, that's how you make the volume appear. Um, but I do have a key command specifically set up for volume, which is V. So when you hit the V key, that will show the volume automation. Similarly, the P key will open up pan automation, so you can pan things left and right. Where is that? There we are, in orange there. So I can have something start on the left side and have it move to the right side. Drivers are configured properly in Reaper. Um, but let me just talk about sort of the basics of automation, like how you, how you edit it, how you work with it. Um, so I'm going to kind of start from scratch here and pretend we've got this piece of music. Uh, we've got our voice. I'm going to hide this for a moment. The Q key, by the way, uh, that hides and reveals all the different automation. Um, so this is sort of similar to what I mocked up before. We're going to have um, the music play for a bit. We're going to have the, the voice. And then I'm going to automate the volume of the music so it dips down just when the voice is talking and then comes back up at the end so the way i do that first of all i'm going to clear off all this automation that i've already uh, drawn in as a demonstration earlier and i can do that a couple ways um, i can remove that envelope or i can uh yeah i can remove that envelope envelope and automation are kind of the same thing i use those words uh, inter interchangeably but envelope is the actual like line with the points and automation is the thing that the envelope is doing. If that makes sense. Um, but one really easy way, I can just lasso them all and hit delete. Um, so that's really nice. In Pro Tools, uh, depending on what tool you've, collect, or if you've selected, um, automation will work a little bit differently. Um, but here it's very intuitive. Uh, if you click, double click, you make a point if you double click that point again, it deletes it. Uh, similar to Pro Tools, if you option click a point, that will delete it. And then also shift clicking will add a point. And then command draw will let you draw that way. Um, but I would say, especially when I'm like on a deadline and having to work quickly, I'm usually trying to use relatively few automation points. I'm just trying to like get things in the right ballpark, ballpark really quickly. So this will help me demonstrate a few things that you can do in Reaper. So um, if I click, let's say I'm going to make four points of automation. So that'll be like my fade starting, my fade ending, and then starting to move back up and then uh, hitting back up again. So I can just pull that down. and I can place it where I want it to go. And I would say typically, um, uh, I'm usually, when I'm putting music into sort of more of a bed, I'm dropping it by about 12 decibels. I'll talk about this more when we get into the template because this starts to tie into sort of my mix workflow. Um, but 
uh, first, let's just talk about how you edit the different pieces of automation. So you can drag any point around, um, as you'd expect. You can, let's say I wanted to make a, a more gentle curve. I can start to add more points and make something that's a little bit more S-like if I wanted a smoother curve. But let's say I didn't want to do that. Let's say I just wanted to uh, do this very fast. I can also hold down the Option key and click on a segment and start to bend it, similarly to how I did with uh, like at the end of a, a f uh, the fade on a file. And so you can um, change the shape that way. You can also right click on it and uh, manually set a different type of fade. Um, so you can customize it in all these different ways. Um, but more often than not, I'm trying to just like do things pretty quickly. So I'll make like a uh, like a quick fade with just a few points and then I'll use option to kind of give a, a smoother curve to that fade and that way I'm not just like doing all these clicks um, all these points um, and I, I work faster that way um, and again sometimes I do just want to freehand it so that way um, in that mode I would hit command and then just draw yes Joe you have a question I was wondering for volume automation, Brendan, if it's possible to also use a fader and ride it in real time to input. Yep. To input yeah, totally. Um, so this works similarly to Pro Tools. Um, in this automation mode right here, if I click that, um, this is how I set whether it's on read mode, touch mode, latch mode, write mode. So I would often do that through uh, touch mode. Um, and this is especially handy if you happen to have a control surface, um, but you don't have to do it from a control surface. You can do it from the fader itself. So like if I play and then start to move the fader, it'll write Audio that device automation. drivers are configured properly in Reaper. And like that so. you're hearing this successfully without... And the thing about touch mode is as soon as I let it go, it'll go back into uh, read mode. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to select all of that and delete it. Um, just so you're aware, there's also this other mode, which is a little bit different, which I won't go into too much detail talking about, which is trim read mode, which is not the same as Pro Tools read mode. Uh, read mode in Reaper is what you'd expect in most other uh, editing platforms. Trim read is a way of both having things be in read mode and also being able to use the faders at the same time. And then you can use some commands to add an extra layer of, okay, I've, I've got the automation, but now I want to move the whole automation down six decibels, and then you can set it down six decibels. It's not a way that I tend to work, um, but it's a possibility. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening um, file management-wise, because that's a really important part of any project. If you remember, um, at the very beginning, when we dragged in these files, it created this peaks folder. Um, but unlike Pro Tools, uh, in Pro Tools, you have to save a session before you even start working in it. Um, and then when you import a file, it'll also copy a version of that file into an audio files folder. Um, in Reaper, it it will only do that, or the way I've set it up, it will only do that when you finally save. So this is an unsaved session right now. So just to demonstrate that, if I go to File, Save Project As, I'm going to save this on my desktop, and I'm going to call it, uh, I've already made a demo session, but we'll make this demo session two. Demo session two. And what this is going to do is it's going to create a new folder called Demo Session 2. And then inside that folder, it's going to create a .rpp file. That's the Reaper session file um, called Demo Session 2. And then depending on whether I have these checked, uh, it will make an audio files folder and either copy all media into project directory, or if you're feeling uh, dangerous, you can move all media into project directory. So you have to be careful with what you're doing. Like if you had two projects referencing the same file, you wouldn't want to move them. So I, I think it's safer to do copy all media into project, which will mean that you're making a new copy of the file and putting it in that audio files folder. And those files will still exist in, in this case in the downloads directory. Um, 
So I'm, I'm making more data, but uh, I'm doing it in a safer way. So I'm gonna hit save. It's gonna copy, it's gonna rebuild the peaks. And just to demonstrate, um, when I go to my desktop folder, close this other stuff for you. And now here is my demo session two folder. And in it, I've got an audio files folder. I've got the RPP and it's moved all the um, media into that audio files folder. And um, unlike Pro Tools, it didn't convert it into a wave or anything. I'm just pulling straight from the same um, MP3. Um, and then I've got my peaks folder there as well with the data that Reaper needs to see the waveforms. So that way um, I've got everything that I need in that folder. And then the way that I collaborate with folks is um, I, I work mostly exclusively in, in Dropbox. So like I'll make a copy of that, put it into my personal Dropbox or my work Dropbox. So here it is, demo session two. And then um, uh, let me just close this project for a minute. I'm gonna reopen it in my Dropbox. So I'm actually doing the right thing. Demo session two. And so whenever I'm starting a new project um, and I'm collaborating with someone, I'll do a save project as, and then I'll do uh, you know the date usually, and then my initials and maybe a version number um, and save. And that way uh, I'm never stepping on anyone else's toes. Uh, it's always really clear because they, they see in Dropbox that like, oh, I'm working in this new file. Um, and so that's how I will work with people is I'll have different people working on different elements um, and working on smaller things and then eventually copying and pasting those smaller things into larger projects. And that's how I get into making something that's like this big um, is because there are several people working on it at a time and we're all working on different elements. And then, um, and then I'm able to, you know, modularly kind of fit it all together. And then once we've got an episode put together, then we can start doing the same process on this whole assembly. Uh, yeah, Mitra. Hi, yeah, um, I uh, am primarily a video editor, but I'm curious about this with audio stuff, obviously. Um, so with, with this, how easy is it um, if I'm, you know, creating a, a, a edit here, saving it, importing that into my uh, video editor? So for me, I'm a Premiere person. And okay. then if I need to make a change and then you, you, how easy is it in terms of talking to those, those in NLEs? Do you mean talking to other programs, like collaborating with other software? Yeah. Yeah. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to make a, a change to my audio and getting it into my NLE and how easy. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. And NLE was the word that I was like, what, what is she? Oh, and non, non-linear editor. <laughs> 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 gotcha. Well, there are a bunch of answers to this. It depends on how much edit flexibility you need at whatever stage of the project or whether your project is sort of locked at this point. Um, but let me just answer that in a couple ways. Um, the first is, uh, by the way, you can put video files in Reaper. Um, let me just do this really quick. So like here are my recordings from one of the previous uh, Zoom sessions. Turn in, okay. So uh, if you go in Reaper under view and video, you've got a video window. And so you can just pop video files into Reaper like this as people are filtering. And so when I'm doing sound for picture, um, I'll pop a video track up to the top like that. And then I can do all of my sound design in reference to it. Um, you can also actually do basic video editing in Reaper as well. You can edit it the same way as you'd edit sound, you know, um, and then you can export it as a video instead of um, exporting the sound. That doesn't really answer your question, I realize. Um, but, but it's a good thing to know that you can do. Um, but the way that I tend to work with people when I'm doing sound for picture is usually it's locked at that point. So the video is not moving around. Um, and then I'll either uh, bounce, like I'll, I'll either do the mix on my own and I'll just like bounce a file, um, which I, ha I haven't shown yet. Um, or I will bounce to stems, meaning that I'll like do music and sound effects and dialogue on different tracks um, and export each one of those as a different thing. 
Um, and then there are some scenarios where I need to be, uh, where I need to have more edit control going back and forth between the program. Um, and then I will use this third party application called AA Translator, which is actually a Windows program. And it's like kind of expensive. It's a couple hundred bucks. Um, but this allows me to translate uh, different types of file uh, editing formats into, you know, into Reaper or also into Pro Tools, although it, it does a quite a, a good job converting things into Reaper's format and it does a less good job uh, and more problematic job converting to Pro Tools. And that mostly has to do with Pro Tools file format. But like this is how I could sometimes collaborate with, with other folks that way. Um, but in my experience, when you're doing sound for picture, uh, usually the picture is locked at that point. And, uh, and so I'm not having to send back like edit decisions and stuff, or I'm only exporting certain portions of the project. Like how, how, what, how would you do it? Um, I typically would do that, but I, um, I'm in a new position where it's, it's news. So sometimes things you think you're done and <laughs> right. then you get a quick change um, yeah. right before. So yeah. I'm just curious about the flexibility of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it would depend on like what the final destination of the, um, you know, if it has to go back into a video editor, then I think that you'd want to export things in a more modular type way. Um, uh, and I see in the chat that Mikhail is asking about OMF and AAF support. Uh, Reaper doesn't have that built in by default, but that's what this third party uh, program will do for me. There's another, there's another program called um, Vordio, uh, which you can Google, which I haven't tried yet myself. Um, and it's more based specifically for a video, like audio to video type workflow. Um, and that might have some um, capabilities that I'm not familiar with, but that's one I just learned about a few days ago, actually. Um, but when it comes to OMF and AAF, usually I am... Um, importing that stuff from like uh, a, a video editing program. So someone will give me an AAF or an OMF um, and then I'll use this to turn it into Reaper um, and that works pretty well. And then this would allow me to export a Reaper session as an OMF or AAF. But like the problem with that is then you're also, it's only the very basic mix data. It's, it's like the clip position and the volume data and it's not, you're not gonna get plugins or you know, any sort of more detailed work that you're doing. Um, so that's just goes with the territory, I guess, when it comes to OM, OMF and AAF. I haven't talked about my template yet. Um, so I'm going to open up a new tab and then I'm going to open up my template. So it's under file project templates, Brendan's radio and podcast template. Um, so this is an example of like a note that you could leave, um, uh, you can, this is a project note and I have it set up. So the project notes load automatically whenever a template is loaded. So this is just like my little info about, Hey, I made this template. Um, and you can clear it by hitting cancel or okay. Um, but if you were collaborating with someone with a, using project notes, that's what they would see when they open up a new session. Um, and what I'm going to do is take this little demo session that I just made of uh, voice and music. And I'm going to copy those whole tracks and paste them into this template that I just made. And now I'm going to put them where they need to go. So I'm going to um, put the voice there and then drag the music there. And the cool thing, and this is like something that uh, it, when I copied a track, I'm copying everything about the track. I'm copying um, all of the plugins. I'm copying all of, any of the automation. Um, so it kind of works, uh, it does the same thing as Pro Tools import session data, but in a much more graphically intuitive way where I'm actually getting <laughs> the thing that I want, which I, it is just harder to do uh, when, you're, um, when you're working in Pro Tools. So that's how I would uh, sort of cross between sessions. And now I've got all this stuff in this new session. Um, and... Uh, just to sort of keep rolling with this idea of we're making just sort of mocking up 
an audio clip that would um, have the music go down a little bit while someone's talking and then go back up and then fade out. So like this could be an ad spot or, you know, whatever. Um, now, I haven't talked about this yet, and this is a huge part of the system that I'm teaching with this template. So one of the reasons that I had you install this SWS plugin extension and why I spent so much time going over that is it adds this feature, which is amazing. So if you click on any item and hit the N key, it will do a little process. It will analyze the file and change its loudness to a specific loudness target. Um, in this case, uh, for anyone who's used loudness units, the loudness target that I've set N to is negative 23 LU. Um, can I get a show of hands? How many of you, if I say LUFs or loudness units, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so I'm getting one for sure no. Um, so I should explain. Okay, loudness units are basically a way of measuring the average loudness of a track. So whereas decibels, which is the way we often talk about sound, they're like a hyper-scientific moment-to-moment uh, reading of the sound pressure or the you know the sound level of a given sound whereas loudness units or lu is basically a way of saying if i looked at that sound in you know let's say three second chunks over time what would the average loudness be or if i looked at the overall average loudness of a chunk of sound what would that overall average be and that's what I'm doing when I'm um, hitting the N key is it's running this whole process and it's saying um, that the, the average, it, it's, not, it's, it's both reading the average loudness, but then adjusting each clip uh, either up or down um, in order to make that item the, 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 that same target loudness. So when it comes to dialogue, that can be super, super powerful because I can make well, the first thing that I'll do is if this was a long interview and I drop it in there, I'll have it run the dialogue uh, or the loudness normalization. Um, it'll make the adjustments and it will say, okay, so in order to achieve your negative uh, 23 LU target, um, that's the, the mix level that I'm trying to mix all of my voices around. Um, I need to bump or it will automatically bump the file up by, in this case, one point three seven decibels and that that's the cool thing about loudness unit and decibels is that if you need to adjust by two lu you actually only it corresponds to decibels so i can adjust the fader by two decibels and it will also bring it up by two lu it makes sense when you think about uh loudness units being a kind of average of sound over time but the really cool thing is from there knowing that this is my average I can also like with this little part here that seems to be quieter, I can break that off into its own region and run the process again, um, make a little crossfade, and now ops, um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. Now that bit that was a little bit quieter is also adjusted to that same level. Um, so it can be a super time-saving tool, but there are also some pitfalls that we should be conscious about. Um, one is let's say that um, we had an item that was just room tone. So if I run this process on room tone, it's going to adjust the room tone so it achieves that same loudness, meaning it's going to sound like, st like static or like noise, basically. Um, so you want to be careful of those situations. And then you also want to be careful that you're not doing this on um, something that's too, like, too short of an item. Um, so it's not something where I would want to go like, you know, syllable by syllable and then, cause that would sound really weird. Um, if I did something like that and run this process, I would have a lot more jumping around and that you're hearing this successfully without any glitches or pops. Um, it actually wasn't that bad, but you can see how it could be bad. Um, so what I'll do is I'll kind of do it from like, a moment to moment kind of thing. And uh, I'll also use my sort of eyeballs and judgment and sort of be able to see like, okay, uh, I need to run that, I need to run that, and then get things kind of in the right ballpark. Um, and this will 
alone already start setting me up for having um, a smoother mix overall. So something that I notice a lot, uh, especially among people who have been doing radio for a long time, is they'll make all of their um, volume adjustments on the volume track here. And that's actually something that I don't recommend. What I try to tell people in the way that I train folks is make all of your corrective audio adjustments up here on the item, um, or in Pro Tools, this would be called clip gain. Um, make them all up here so you're getting the same general loudness. And then, um, and then when you do the V key for volume, this volume then becomes like your creative volume or like changing the relative balance between music and voice. And so you're not doing a lot of micro stuff up here. Um, this is much more like about fading things in and out. So just to take this a, a step further, uh, I can also, so the, the same way that V was the volume key for a track, on individual items, I can do Shift V. And then I've got a line right here. And for anyone who's used Pro Tools, this is kind of like a uh, clip gain and Pro Tools. Well, they're both like cl cl clip gain, um, but this will give me an even greater level of control. So I can, the same way that I made automation points before, I can start to draw in points and make adjustments. But then the cool thing is I can also see that the waveform is changing in response. So uh, it's some nice visual feedback for that kind of thing. Audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper. So um, something, this isn't a bad P-pop, but P-popping is a problem that you will have from time to time, right? And there are a number of ways that you can um, you know, address that. But one simple way of doing it is just by uh, making three points and ducking down the P until it's no longer offensive. Configured properly in Reaper. So again, that was not necessary in this case, but that's how you do it. And then you get that visual feedback. Um, and one of the ways that this is different than Pro Tools is that in Pro Tools, if you hide the volume line on the item, that volume automation stays in place. Uh, it doesn't go away. But here, uh, it's like bypassing it. So um, when I see this line, when I am using Shift V, that's a signal that I've made some sort of adjustment. Um, and when I don't see that line, then I'm just going by this um, this value alone. So be aware of that. I kind of like it this way because then I know I still have this value, but then I know that it's this value plus this little adjustment that I've made. Um, and the key commands for that, by the way, uh, for changing um, clips or items uh, volume is control shift up and down. So holding this is on the Mac, control and shift up and down and it will raise and lower by a decibel and you can actually reset it by control shift right and then it will go back to its original setting or you could run n on it again and then it will make that adjustment so this is how when i'm just starting to do um, dialogue mixing um, I'll, I'll run a combination of these processes or i'll even sometimes just look and get a sense of what the ranges are when i run n um, and then know that like I need to make certain adjustments. And also um, I would add that I feel like our ears are sensitive to volume changes of more than three decibels at a time. So uh, in this case, I've got to jump from almost zero decibels to plus five. One way of uh, hiding that is by making a, a crossfade. Um, um, and that it sounds like smooth. This actually didn't sound that bad to me, but there are times when that can feel really jumpy, um, in which case it might make sense to start to break things up a little bit smaller and then see if you can kind of work your way in increments of three up towards wherever loudness you need to go, if, if that makes sense. Um, but again, I'm doing all the corrective stuff on the clip level or item level, and then I'm doing... Um, fade in, fade out, that kind of thing, um, or relative balance adjustments through the volume here. And that's just, that's how I, I tend to work. Um, so that's all, using this function on dialogue, but when it comes to music, let's think about this. So uh, I will also run the loudness normalization on pieces of music. And the theory behind this is that 
in the moments when music is in the clear and not competing with the voice at all, that it should be at about the same level as the voice. Um, sometimes you'd want it to be louder than the voice and you can work around that. But this is a way of getting your music tracks relatively in the ballpark in reference to that voice. And then from there, all of your creative adjustments down on the track volume um, are mostly subtractive. So um, in this case, this is where I said earlier that I'm usually pushing the music tracks um, about 12 decibels quieter than the voice tracks. That What I mean is w once I've done that loudness normalization, um, then I can start to do that, that um, pushing down of tracks. So let's just hear how that sounds. And this is just a really quick and dirty assembly, right? But audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper and that you're hearing this successfully without any glitches or pops um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. And then if I did want the music to be, you know, louder, then I could, you know, push it up more. But it's, it's a way of knowing that um, it's going to be about the same level as the voice um, whenever my fader is at zero decibels, if that makes sense. Um, so all of these things together, um, once I do these kind of basic, like getting things in the ballpark, then I can start to get much more um, particular about, okay, I actually do want the music to hit a little bit louder here, and I can make those creative decisions really intentionally. Um, but on top of that, uh, this template that I built also has a bunch of pre-configured plugins and stuff that are doing some additional leveling out of... Um, of the voices as well. So if I click effects here, um, you can see what I'm doing. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat here. Levi asks, so Brendan, are you feeding the clips into your compressor at negative 23 luffs or are you compressing your clip and then using N? That's a great question. Um, it's the first. So the order of operations is, and this is true in Pro Tools as well, I believe, um, is that all of the adjustments made on the clip level are the first thing happening to the sound. Then it's running through all of the effects plugins. And then after the effects plugins, then it's going to the volume as you've seen here. Um, so that's another reason why uh, I want to do my corrective volume adjustments before the plugins. Um, so the plugins can do additional leveling out um, if I did all of my adjustments afterwards, then the compressor is doing all this work ahead of time, and then I'm additionally changing it. It just it doesn't make sense. Um, so that's why it's set up that way. And then as far as what uh, is happening in this plugin chain, I'll just run you through the defaults that I've set up. And this is like very kind of a generic type setup um, that's meant to be a starting place. It's, uh, it's not going to replace a, a really like a trained engineer. Um, but it will get your mixes sounding pretty good pretty quickly. Um, the first thing that I'm doing is a little bit of uh, Reaper's noise reduction. And um, for anyone who's used Isotope RX Denoiser, it's doing something kind of similar. It's a, it's a similar type of a process, but I'll, I'll walk you through how that process works. Um, the idea is that you use this plugin, which is it's a built-in Reaper plugin. It's free, so that's the other reason why I have it uh, is I wanted this template to be completely free. Um, uh, so this is with the caveat that like this type of noise reduction does not sound as good as like a third-party like Isotopes Dialog Denoiser, which I think sounds excellent. Um, but it does work in a pinch, and it's free. And if you happen to be like stuck someplace without your plugins, you know you've always got these basic, you know, building block tools to work with. So Reefer um, has a few different modes, but in the subtractive mode, what you do is I basically find some room tone and I loop that room tone. I've got my loop button on right here. Um, and I make this loop by hitting the C key. I think of C as cycle. Um, that's not a Pro Tools plugin. I think that's actually something I stole from Logic, um, but uh, it worked within my available keys, so I went with it. So hitting C to create a time selection, and now it's just going to loop that bit of. Let me let me mute the music. Um, it's going to loop that bit of um, sound. 
So it's just looping the noise floor, in this case, the room tone. Um, and I'm going to reset the plugin and say automatically build noise profile, enable during noise. So I click that, and then it's making this red line, which is representative of just the sound of the, the noise of the room, um, the room tone. So it only needs to do that a couple cycles, only, only once really, but um, you know, it'll stabilize, and then you can uncheck it, and now it's set, and it's you know, ready to go. And then from that point forward, um, any sound that you're playing is subtracting the, the room tone from the sound and leaving the stuff that's not room tone. Um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. Uh, so like a lot of noise reduction, if, you, if, it, if you're using it too aggressively you, and if you start to hear it working, that's usually a sign that it, you're using too much of it. Um, and it says actually hint, uh, shift draws line, command moves all. So by, oops, by hitting command, I can turn the effect down a little bit um, that's how you do it. Um, and that it sounds like... So if it's too high, it would sound like this. Um, and that it, it would sounds start to sound like, like Zoom, clear actually. Audio. Very garbled. It's a way of synthesizing Zoom's audio, <laughs> now that I think about it. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I would just turn it down a little bit that way. Um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. So that's the noise reduction. Um, and then after the noise reduction, I have uh, what is called downward expansion. Um, it's kind of working the same way as a, a gate would work, uh, but I tend to think gates sound really bad. Gates are basically like saying, um, whenever someone's not talking, just chop off the audio. And so you, you, it has this very sort of on off kind of quality to it but it's a way of reducing some noise. What this is doing instead is it's saying, whenever someone's not talking, just turn down the audio a little bit. Uh, and so when you have the, um, the loudness normalized set for negative 23 LUFS, that is also, it's, it's, these plugin settings are calibrated so that a voice recorded in a relatively quiet room um, will that th this will be set pretty well for that kind of um, audio so when you're using the um the denoising and the uh downward expansion together it is pretty effective at um taking a sort of less than ideal uh recording and making it feel more like you're in a studio it has that more sort of dead no not less reverb more controlled kind of sound um and so that's why I have the, the tracks in this um, purple studio space. Uh, that's, that's why I have those, config those plugins configured the way that um, they're configured. Okay, so just to recap, we've got our noise reduction, we've got our downward expansion or gating, um, and then we've got some EQ. And the EQ that I'm doing here is like super light touch. I'm basically just screening out uh, the very low frequencies that would be kind of the thumpy, you know, P and B pop kind of frequencies. Uh, I am adding a little bit of um, high end on the top, but only like a decibel. But mostly what I've done is I've created these different points that you can edit um, that are kind of meant to be the common areas that you would start to uh, shape a voice with. So, um, two is the bassiness device drivers are configured properly in reaper and that you're hearing this successfully so without and down any. uh three is the sort of middle range kind of muddy frequency kind of the ho, 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 those things um so i typically are i'm trying to screen a little bit of that out that your audio device drivers are configured properly in reaper and that'll and give that you a kind of a tighter sound without um and then i've got a couple other uh um other points there for you to edit okay so that's the eq and then lastly i have got uh, a very light compressor and for anyone who's an engineer or who knows a little bit about compressors i won't go into a lot of detail but it's a um it's a peak compressor it's pretty it's set pretty fast um it's a ratio of two to one um and it is only compressing about two to three decibels 
So the idea is that it's just catching those really fast transients of someone laughing or coughing or whatever. It's, it's, it's not doing a ton, but it's just leveling out the very peaks um, of the signal. And so I have those same plugins on different studio tracks. And so if you had a two-way that is meant to be like two people in a studio, um, that's you could have different settings for different voices if you wanted. Um, and if you wanted to uh, add a third voice, you could just duplicate the tracks and make Studio 3, and you can customize this template for you know whatever your needs are. Um, I think in a lot of the work that I'm doing, it's mostly uh, one person in a studio like the host, and then there are actualities of like people out in the field or you know uh, interviews, um, and that's what I would put in this next chunk. But before I get to that, um, let me talk about um, this indentation that you're seeing. Do you see how there are sort of like uh, this folder, but then this fold these folders are below the other folder? Let me just show you how you do that, and I'm going to do that in a new project tab. So if I make a bunch of tracks, command T, command T for track, I can shift click to select a few of them. And then I can drag them around to change their order. And you can see that little outline of me moving it around. Uh, but I can also sort of put them under and up. It's kind of like you have to push them it's like you have to kind of find the indent with your mouse, but you'll see how it changes a little bit. And now uh, this has become a folder track um, or a parent track. And then these are child tracks. So um, this can be handy for a bunch of reasons. Um, one is just basic organization purposes. So um, uh, I can name this, you know, one, two, and three. And then I can um, mute all the tracks at once by muting this. Basically, everything that's all the audio that's happening in these tracks uh, gets routed into the, the, the parent track. Um, so that can be a really helpful way of um, both organizing, but also creating different sound designs. So anything that I do, all the things that I, um, all the adjustments that I make on this track will also apply to all the tracks that are routing into it. Um, and if you've used other programs, um, this is akin to busing. Uh, it actually is, it is busing. It's basically the folder tracks are automatically creating buses whenever you put them in and out of that, um, kind of arrangement, but, um, they're doing it very quickly. Like you can take them out and then those buses disappear. Um, so it works very fast that way. Um, but that is all happening in addition to any other routing that you might you know, sends and receives and other uh, other things that you might be doing to the tracks. Um, and this has become such a huge part of my sound design. So like um, I just closed the, the Wolverine track, but what I'll end up doing is creating like sort of different folders within folders and, and almost like worlds within worlds of sound design. Um, so if there's like a TV in the back of a room, um, like there's a voice that's going through a filter that's making it sound like a TV, but then that TV is going through a reverb. And then there are other people in the room that are also going through that same reverb. And you can create these kind of like Russian doll like structures of sound that replicate the way that sound works in the, the real world. Or at least that's my approach to sound design um, is uh, I think of it as like mimicking the way that sound actually works in the real world and then trying to replicate that um, in my sound design. Um, so this is all to say that this template uses folders as well. Um, and so all the things that are happening in these studio tracks then also go to the studio bus. And you can see that I've got one other effect on the studio bus, which is another compressor. So there are two stages of compression. Um, for the engineers, this is a slower compressor. It's RMS based. Um, and so the theory here is that you've got these two tracks that are going through your first stage of compression independently and then they're all going through this higher stage of slower compression that's on a moment to moment, more average kind of way, leveling out the tracks as well. Um, meanwhile, on the actuality bus, I haven't quite done that. Um, I have, uh, actually I've set them up with no tracks. 
Um, and I put all of my effects on the actuality bus. And um, different engineers will have different approaches here, but my thinking is that when you're making a, a radio story that has a collage of actualities that are recorded in different places, that um, it would be helpful to have all of those different types of material gel and sort of feel like they're sitting in the same space. Um, so I will still add extra EQs and stuff like that if I need to make any corrective, you know, like reducing the muddiness of a room or something like that. I'll, I'll still add those plugins on individual tracks. But then at this higher level, um, they're all going through a similar set of processes. Um, so uh, I've got I, I've got some noise reduction set up here, so it's ready to go. Although I will say that typically for field recordings or actualities, um, I'm also kind of doing that more on a, you know, uh, track to track or like piece of tape to piece of tape type basis. Um, but you can run some general noise reduction if you want. Um, I've turned off this ducking uh, downward expansion thing um, uh, because I think it, it, this is a kind of effect that you'd only really want to have if you're trying to create that very dead studio type of feeling. Um, but it's there in case you need it. So it's there, but it's turned off. Um, I have a little bit more of an aggressive EQ where it's shaping the top and the bottom a little bit more. Um, so it's cutting out a little bit more of the lows and just a tiny bit of the highs. And it it's comes preset with um, some of that mud reduction. Um, so this is a pretty gentle curve that shouldn't make things sound bad, um, but might start to just tighten up um, sounds that are coming from different places. Um, and again, the theory here is like, I'm trying to be light touch with all of this stuff and just sort of get it set up. So it's doing a little bit of work, um, but not too dramatic. Uh, and then, um, I have the same two stages of compression, a fast stage and a slow stage. And then at the very end, this is like my own little secret sauce thing. Um, I've added this reverb, um, and this is like a very micro, uh, almost you can't perceive it. Like you should only be able to sense it when you have headphones on. Um, but it takes the sound from being like directly in your head, like voice of God style, which is kind of what I would normally expect to happen in the studio. And it makes it feel as if it's almost like a little bit in front of you. Um, or at least that's the theory. Um, so that's my own little thing that I've added there. You can turn it on and off if you want. Um, it won't work for everybody and it might not sound good for everything. So uh, just be aware that that's there. Uh, after that, um, I've got the music bus. And the real thing that's happening with the music bus um, is I've got an EQ on it, which is set very neutrally. It, it has some stuff kind of ready to go. Um, but it's not really doing anything to the music until someone starts talking. So watch what happens to this EQ as the voice speaks. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper and that you're hearing this successfully without any glitches or pops um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. So what's happening here is I've sort of behind the scenes in Reaper routed these tracks in such a way where whenever someone's speaking in the studio space or the or the actuality space, whenever there's a voice um, that could potentially compete with the music, I have this EQ sculpting out a little bit of the mid-range uh, frequencies, the things that might be fighting with the voices. Um, and that EQ is only kicking in when someone's speaking. Um, and if you're an engineer, you can change the shape of this EQ and you can kind of futz with it. I tend to find that having a much broader, um, uh, rather than going super narrow, uh, scoop of EQ is a little bit more transparent. Um, and the, the real idea here is that it's, you don't want to perceive it. If you can hear it working, it's, it's working too hard. Um, so that's, that's the idea. Um, and then for those of you who are into doing a little bit more sound design-y type stuff. These two points of EQ on the end, I've set up as automatable high and low pass filters. So uh, what that means is you can screen out the high and low frequencies uh, with automation. 
And the way you can do that um, is if you hit the Q key, remember Q is showing all the automatable parameters that are set up in the session. That will reveal these two tracks, which is low pass and high pass. And for anyone who doesn't know what that sounds like, um, I can just mock this up. If I automate the high pass, or sorry, automate the low pass filter, um, it's going to sound like this. Audio. It's, uh, it's kind of like a techno-like effect. Radio Lab used to use it a lot. Um, we used it a lot in Love and Radio. Let me just draw this and make it a little bit more gradual so you can hear it. And I'm going to solo. So. Um, it's kind of like a fade out, but it's, it's progressively fading out the high frequencies. Sort of giving it almost that like underwater type quality. And then you can do the opposite. You can also do a high pass, um, which sounds, oops. I made an automation item. I'm not going to talk about that, but I want that to go away. Yeah, leave that alone for now. Uh, high pass, which would sound like the opposite of uh, a low pass filter. So it's screening out the low frequencies. Um, and so this is just a way of like shifting things around and adding a little bit of variation in color. And you don't always want to go like completely, you know, uh, sometimes the, the best thing to do is, um, and this is sort of similar to what we were doing automatically when we were ducking down the mid frequencies, but in this case, it's ducking the high frequencies. Um, I can just scoop out the high frequencies um, while someone's talking. that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. And so this is how I do a lot of my sound design. Um, basically, it's it's uh, sometimes it's not EQ. Sometimes it might be a reverb or a delay or other any other sound effect. Um, but that is how I automate things and kind of have them move around and create variation um, to my sound design. Okay, so that's what's happening on the music track. And then after the EQ, there is a, a limiter. Um, and that's just for protection. Basically, if you had to export as stems, um, so like music, sound effects, voice on different tracks, um, this is adding a limiter uh, to make sure that um, the music track never exceeds um, zero decibels. Um, oh, also there's a reverb on the music track. So um, each one of these music tracks has a send going to this reverb track, which is also automatable. So if you hit Q, you can see that too. And you can send parts of this music to this reverb track by. So that's kind of a lot, but um, some people will use that like at the, as a way to sort of make a piece of music carry on um, as it's fading out. Um, so you can kind of do a bunch of these things in combination yep. with each other. And maybe that's what I want. <laughs> I don't know. I'm doing this all kind of haphazardly, but that's how you do it. Okay. Uh, then we have the sound effects bus. There's really not a whole lot happening here. It's just an EQ that's ready to go if you need to start using it. Um, and then a limiter for protection. Um, and you can add as many sound effects tracks as you need. And then lastly, there is a pre-mastered material track, which... Uh, sits sort of outside the structure of all these other plugins. And the idea here is that if you've got like a clip from another show that's already been mixed or, or your show that's already been mixed or um, something where you don't want it to go through any of this other stuff, you can just put it here, run that automatic loudness normalization on it and it's good to go. So after all of this, uh, this is where we go to the, the master fader, which again, um, I have it turned on and off up here in the corner, but you could also look at it. Um, you could put it in the mixer if you wanted to, but I'm gonna just have us keep looking up here. And the master fader also has a set of effects, which I'll just give you a really quick rundown. The first of which is this Yulene loudness meter that I had you install. And so this is a way of graphing loudness over time. Okay. It's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper and that you're hearing this successfully without any glitches or pops 
um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. <laughs> Except for that bit of noise that I left there. Um, uh, so this will graph your loudness over time, and um, ideally what you want is you want this um, line to sort of be going a little bit above and below the negative 23 mark. So as you can see, this was a little bit louder than I expected. Um, so if that's a problem I'm running into, I would have to go back, double check my loudness, also make sure that my volume is set where it needs to be, which it does seem to be. It could be uh, because the music is in there too. Um, and maybe, I, yeah, you know what it is? Because I didn't really scoop out the music at all. I thought I had that drawn in, but I can see I, I drew that on the wrong track. So uh, let me just address that by hitting volume and roughing in this music again. Sorry, I get like performance anxiety, like when it doesn't work out in front of you. I'm like, <laughs> I promise it works, you guys. <laughs> uh, Okay, so I'm going to put this down by about 12, like I said. And uh, this is still pretty messy, but um, and I've got some other stuff happening here. Let's give this a shot. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper and that you're hearing this successfully without okay, so it's any better. glitches or pops um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, and like anything, um, it's a combination of both listening and making sure that you, you're not hearing a big loudness difference, um, but also checking your tools and making adjustments um, because you can't automate the entire thing. I mean, I would submit to you that you shouldn't automate the whole thing, that you want um, a level of control. And part of what I'm trying to do with this template is uh, make things semi-automatable, uh, like let's save some time, but still keep the creative decisions um, in our hands as producers. Um, so that's the loudness meter. Um, and then after that, I, have, I haven't really done this very intelligently, um, but it's a, it's a multi-band compressor. So for any engineers who want to do a multi-band compression stage as part of their mastering, this is there and ready to go for you, but it's configured in a way where it's not really doing anything additional to the sound right now. It's pretty neutral. And then lastly, and this is important, um, there is the master limiter. And so uh, for those of you who've been working in um, radio and podcasting, you probably know that uh, the, the, there is a, a sort of recommended loudness target of negative 18 for podcasts. That's kind of a, a, a loudness target that a lot of podcasters are um, are working towards, but it's different for different, you know, Spotify, I think they have it at like negative 14, which I think is high um, personally. But uh, so there's this question that comes up, like, why why are you normalizing to negative 23 when it ultimately needs to go to a negative um, 18 LU mix. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. One has to do with sort of the practicality of mixing. Like if you were trying to mix everything to uh, a negative 18 level uh, on the session itself, you wouldn't have a lot of headroom. Um, you wouldn't have a lot of wiggle room for the compressors to work um, or for someone to temporarily laugh. Or So th by having the negative 23, negative 24 um, target, it is allowing us to make mixes that have that more, uh, have more dynamic range, have more life to them, in my opinion. Um, the other reason is uh, the standard in the television world um, is often negative 24 or negative 23, depending on where in the world you are. Um, but uh, so this basically would allow you to make a world that or make a mix that is going to be compatible for a lot of different output formats. And then at this very last stage in the master limiting stage, you can change the overall level of the whole mix to hit whatever standard target you need to hit. Um, so I have this configured right now. If you go through this whole process of using loudness normalization and um, you know running through the compressors and all that stuff, even if you don't run through the compressors, it'll still get you pretty close. Um, it will give you a mix that 
is has a loudness average loudness of uh, negative eighteen LU with a ceiling of negative two, uh, so it won't go higher than negative two um, in terms of your peak level, and that should be pretty compatible for um, most podcast platforms and um, and put you in the same ballpark as most of the other folks who are mixing shows these days. Um, so that's the template. All right. So that's like the big rundown. Um, you know, from here, I'm happy to sort of like open it up to questions and, and talk about uh, other aspects or anything that I might have missed. Um, and I can also maybe play you some demo sessions of uh, like how I put some of these tools into, into action. Um, but how about I just open it up to questions right now and um, see where, where it takes us. By the way, I'm going to put some resources in the uh, um, in the chat here of other things. Um, first is the Reaper Forum. Um, this is a great place to talk with other folks who are using Reaper. Uh, I find that they're a lot friendlier than the Pro Tools forums. Um, there's less kind of dick swinging. Um, excuse the phrase. Uh, and Here's also a link to uh, Jeff Entman's Reaper for Radio YouTube tutorials, which uh, he takes a slightly different approach to Reaper than I do. Um, again, this is sort of based around a Pro Tools workflow and trying to um, bring Pro Toolers into the Reaper fold and also create opportunities for people who um, can't afford Pro Tools. Um, but trying to create... Uh, basically, my dream is that um, we can create a parallel system in addition to Pro Tools. So it's uh, the radio and podcast industry isn't so um, Pro Tools centric. Um, and I'm hoping that I can convince more engineers to adopt the system. So uh, if they get a, uh, a piece that's been put together in Reaper, that they can finish it in Reaper without asking that producer to like have to export it and, um, you know, jump through a bunch of hoops. Oh, speaking of exporting, I didn't actually talk about bouncing. That's something that I missed that's kind of mission critical. Let's talk about bouncing really quick. Uh, okay, if you were to bounce uh, by default in Reaper, it's gonna bounce everything. Um, and the way that a lot of radio folks tend to work is they'll make their whole session here um, and then they'll have like outtakes and other stuff on, on the side. So, uh, what I do is I try to use the um, time selection, which again is the C key, to set a beginning and end point of the part that I want to export. So I'm setting a time selection first. You can either do that by uh, dragging on the ruler up here or by lassoing and then hitting C. And then you can export a number of ways. You can use this icon that I've set up right here that looks like a waveform and a hard drive. That's one way of doing it. Um, also, command option R, I believe, is Reaper's default. And then I've also set it up for the Pro Tools default, which is command option B. Command option B. And it all takes you to the same window. And then from here, um, just to explain what you're seeing, uh, the source master mix that that's basically saying um, it's exporting from the master fader, which is what you typically want. Um, and then time selection. So uh, you can set it to export the entire project, like I said, but I have it set up for time selection. So you make the time selection and then it's going to export whatever is in between the time selection. And you can actually see where it, it'll tell you this is where it starts, this is where it ends, this is how long it is. You can even add, if there's like a reverb at the end of it, you can add a little padding for an extra tail, like an extra second or whatever of processing, um, just in case the reverb goes on for a little bit. Um, and then browse to whatever directory you want to save it. So I'm going to save it to my desktop. And then I'll just call this demo export. Or whatever I would often put like the date and stuff and then from here it's basically whatever format you want so um, you know I can export it as a wave I can export it as an mp3 as a flac um, it supports a bunch of different 
formats. And this is also how you would do video. Um, if you had a video project or if you were editing video, you can choose the video um, options down here as well. But let's just do an MP3 um, and I can change the bit rate. I'm going to do 192. Uh, and then I can just render it and it will export faster than real time. And then I should have my file. So that's sort of the basic way of uh, rendering. But uh, to Mitra's question earlier about um, working with a nonlinear editor, uh, one of the things that I do sometimes, if I'm in that situation that you described, is instead of exporting from the master mix, I will export stems. It's one of the options here. So you can select tracks. So I can like uh, command click to select a few different tracks. So in this case, I'm just getting the, the bus or the folder level of each of these tracks. And then I can export those, all of those tracks independently. Um, or I can do a combination. I can do the master mix and stems. Um, so there are a few different options. I haven't talked about this in any of my sessions yet, but there's even a way to set up specific regions within the session so you can export like three different chunks of a session as independent files. Um, so for people doing really complex work, that can be really handy. Um, but then you'd export it, it stems just the same way as you'd export other things. And then it will make separate files for each one of those tracks. Um, so obviously that you won't have, um, uh, you won't have, um, the ability to edit within those tracks, you're exporting, you know, the entire track. Um, but that can be a good way of working with uh, a video editor or, or if you have to work with someone who's using pro tools and they refuse to use Reaper, this is a way of getting some of your, um, tracks to them and also giving the Pro Tools some mix control so they can do some additional mixing in addition to whatever you've done here. And um, in that situation, depending on what I need to do, I could even export all the tracks individually if I wanted to. Um, that's always an option. Um, but my the big thing that I've been advising people is I feel like if you start a project in um, a program, you should try to finish it in the program. Um, except when you start in Pro Tools, in which case, uh, if you're working with me, I will insist on converting it to Reaper eventually so I can finish it in Reaper. Uh, but there are times when I collaborate with folks where that's not an option and then I just have to suck it up and use Pro Tools. But um, when I have a choice, this is what I'm doing. Lauren says, EQing is still intimidating to me. Are there plugins that will do a decent EQ for podcasts without worrying about specific settings? Um, yeah, I, this is sort of just like where it gets into like how much of the thing do you want to automate? Like there are plugins out there that do some degree of like automatic EQing. Um, they tend to be expensive third-party plugins. Um, I am personally of the philosophy that uh, less EQ is better um, typically, unless there's like a specific problem that you're trying to fix. Um, I actually think one of the common things that I hear in people who are just starting to mix for the first time is that they over EQ, that they're, they're doing too much. Um, so I, I am philosophically more inclined to keep things more neutral and clean and more sort of true to life. And then as far as like best practices for EQing, I mean, I've, I've by setting up some of the automatic spots, um, I've tried to, here, let me pull this up again once more. Uh, I've tried to make it so it's like relatively easy. Uh, you just sort of turn on the points that you need and then you can like screen out. Basically you want to screen out anything that's not the voice uh, for one. Um, so anything that's super high that, uh, um, you know, and actually I tend to leave the high end alone almost completely. But any, as soon as you start hearing the EQ working, if it's starting to affect your bass, I think that that is kind of a sign that you've done too much. Um, and I think you can get a lot of mileage just with this one spot right here in the low mids, um, which is around the 250 hertz range. And I don't normally pull it more than like three or four decibels, uh, but that tends to just tighten up that muddy range and make things feel a lot clearer. Somehow just like removing that lets the other things shine, um, which I think 
uh, that's another thing that you'll hear a lot of people talk about with EQ, which I agree with, which is uh, subtractive EQ is better than adding. D boosting, boosting is usually not your friend. Um, boosting will usually make things sound worse. Uh, you typically just want to get rid of the stuff that sounds bad. Um, and sometimes you do that by playing some audio and trying to find where it sounds bad, like, like boosting in order to find the trouble spots and then cutting. Um, that's a good practice. Um, but I'll tell you, I think most of the problems that I notice happen in the low mid range, right around there. Um, unless you're talking about a specific, like a room that has a resonance where it's like ringing at a certain frequency. Um, and then you can be like hyper precise about, uh, making a very narrow, um, very narrow band and screening it out that way. Um, but you know. That doesn't happen often because that happened in conference rooms and now no one's in conference rooms anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? Is there anything that I missed uh, in the questions in the chat? Feel free to hop on the mic if uh, you want. Otherwise, I can just play you a, a little excerpt of something and we can maybe watch along with it. Brendan, real quick one. Yeah. What's the difference in dialogue boxes? What's the difference between uh, apply and okay? Ah, yes. So like you probably noticed that in the render. Um, apply means like, let's say I've set my output directory, like I've gone to my desktop and I've said, okay, I want to export to the desktop. If I hit apply, I'm not rendering yet, but if I close this and I reopen it, that setting has been accepted. So apply is sort of basically saying, make it so. And, uh, and I'm trying to think of other areas where you just get okay, maybe in the preferences. Yeah, in the preferences, um, there's apply and okay. And um, and I think in the preferences, when you make a change, you can hit apply and the preferences will stay open. But as soon as you hit okay, it closes the preferences. Okay is like, okay, I'm done with this panel, get rid of it. <laughs> and apply is like, make it so. Is there an easy way to sweep for subtractive EQ? Learning how to EQ is sort of like it takes some time and experience and your ears get attuned to it. Um, I mean, the way that I do it, just sort of generally speaking, is I'm going to solo this for a minute. Um, when I sweep for EQ is like, uh, so I'm going to turn all this other EQ off. But let's just take point four here. And I'm going to turn it on. and. Um, I'm going to loop, maybe loop a section and just see if I can find a problem spot in my voice. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that, here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that, here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that, here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that, here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that, here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure. I mean, honestly, I'm not hearing a ton of like things that I would want to change. <laughs> I wouldn't want to change my own voice. Uh, what I mean is like, I'm not hearing resonances. I'm not hearing things that are like, oh, that sounds kind of like muddy. And part of that is I'm in a treated room. So I'm not getting some of that same kind of thing that you might uh, get out in the world. Uh, and I'm also pretty close to my mic. So all these things together are, yeah. But that's the idea is that you're sweeping and that it's more like you'll you'll notice it when you feel it like it'll jump something will jump out to you a little bit and uh, um and oh oh so you maybe, maybe this is your question you're saying is there an easy way to sweep for subtractive eq is subtractive the the, the word here so what what i'm doing is i'm trying to find by being additive i'm trying to find the thing that sounds bad and then i'm pulling back i'm doing the opposite of it to be subtractive is that that that's what i mean um and then when it comes to like any of the eq that you would leave additive um like a little goes a long way like um here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly in reaper and like that maybe something 
up in there, you know, like, but I, I wouldn't want to go much higher than a couple decibels um, when I'm boosting. Um, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned audio and MIDI in the same track. Can you elaborate? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, it does sort of raise the question, like, why would you want to do that? Um, but one thing you can do in Reaper, because you can mix audio and MIDI together. Well, here's something that I haven't said yet. Um, that, and I, this will get around to answering your question. So one of the cool things you can do that I don't think you can do on any other editing program is you can apply effects and VSTs and stuff um, to individual items themselves. So uh, right now I've got no effects on this music track, but um, I can do Shift E and it's, it's opening up a plugin window and I can add an EQ. Um, and now this EQ is just applied to this one particular chunk of sound. And so with more advanced plugins that are doing things like um, de-essing or denoising, like this can be a way of not having a, a plugin run on the whole track, but just have it do a particular spot thing. So it has the same kind of functionality in a way that um, Audio Suite would in, in Pro Tools, but the big difference is Audio Suite is completely destructive. With Audio Suite, you're making new files for each time you apply the effect. Also, this is automatable. So um, just to show you, uh, la, 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 la. how do I do this quickly? Um, that same kind of high and low pass filtering that I was doing on the music, um, I can do it here. The key command is uh, command shift E and it will open up a version of this plugin window, uh, automation plugin window. But in this case, command shift E clicking on a item, it's this plugin that I apply just to this thing. And then I can automate the frequency and I'll get a line the same way that I had like shift V for volume. I can do that here. So I can add a bunch of sound design just on a particular item. I can automate it, which you can't do in audio suite in Pro Tools. Any glitches or pops um, and that it's, well, you can't really hear it because the volume is down, but yeah. So that's really fun. Um, and you can do all sorts of really cool stuff that, that way. Um, and uh, so with when it comes to MIDI, let's say that I had a MIDI instrument that I wanted to put on a sound effects track, but I didn't want to create a whole new track just for the MIDI instrument. That would be an example. Um, I could draw a MIDI item. So this is actually, when I've got nothing selected and I hit command and I drag, it'll make a, a empty MIDI item. So this, if, you if I double clicked it, this is where I could start, you know, programming in notes and stuff and making a MIDI item. Um, and right now that's just a blank chunk of MIDI. It's not, uh, it's not going to any instrument, but I can also do a shift E and then add a, um, a VSTI. So a MIDI instrument. Um, and then uh, in theory, that'll play. Uh, any other questions? I'll tell you what, how about um, we just close out the night and um, I will show you just sort of how I put all this stuff together. Um, and uh, this is going to be an excerpt from the last piece that I did for Love and Radio um, called Doing the No-No. And it's about a bio artist named Adam Zaretsky who um, wants to use living things in the art that he makes, but very controversially uh, 
he's also kind of a provocateur and his dream is that he wants to genetically engineer a human embryo as a work of art. Um, so this is the very opening scene for that, that story. Um, and what you're going to see here is you've got uh, sound effects in pink and actually that um, there is some item automation happen item sound effect automation happening there so you can see that um, most of the sound design is just happening with a collage of different pieces of music and then um, there's not a ton happening in the voice but um, we can watch it all happen together and maybe I can put on the music bus so you can see how the music is automated uh, let me just see if there's any other track automation happening here not a ton. Let's just play it. I made a sculpture of Uranus's castrated penis. Apparently, Kronos cut off his father's penis and threw it in the ocean in the Peloponnesian Sea. He cut off his father's penis because his mother gave birth to a hundred-handed titan, like a centipede human. And Uranus was so grossed out by the mutant with the hundred hands that he kept that being, that person, his child, inside a cave, inside of a castle. Even some people say he pushed it back up into his wife Gaia's vagina at which point she told her son Kronos why don't you go cut his dick off right and he did he sliced off his father's penis and he threw it in the sea and from the foam and blood of the leaking castrated penis of Uranus came Aphrodite the goddess of beauty it's a strange myth I didn't know really much about it. I had gone for the centipede thing because I thought, well, maybe I'll make a person with a hundred hands someday. But every time someone chooses someone else to make a baby with, they're making a freak for their own pleasure. It doesn't matter if it's random recombination. It doesn't matter if it's based on love. It doesn't matter if this being is cared for, sent to like a really nice preschool you know, or fed well, or fed a bunch of crap. What matters is reproduction itself is kind of like a freak show, right? You want people to see your display of fertility. You want people to see that you have the wealth to go ahead and procreate. You want people to see your child perform a piano recital. And you want to be able to show off that your genes were worthy of getting to the next generation. It's really kind of sad. Breeding is narcissism. It's like your little mirror, right? I was in a meeting that was talking about the ethics of genetic modification, and they asked parents to raise their hand if they would be willing to pay an extra five or $10,000 to have children with guaranteed perfect pitch so that they would, you know, basically not need to pay for all those piano lessons, right? And most parents were like, yeah, that's cheaper in the long run. I mean, and that's partly what they were thinking, but they were also thinking, I'd like a kid who's a good musician. But I do know when people go to for genetic counseling, if they were offered not only to eliminate negative traits, but to add positive traits. As long as you put a price tag on it, someone's gonna hit by it now. It's the other side of the mountain effect. And it's what will drive personal genetic alteration. There are certain people that think that the human genome is sacrosanct, that it's okay to engineer every other organism on earth except for humans. Humans have to do it the old fashioned way by luck, including losing through luck. And there are other people that really think that we should just go forward as fast as possible and are actually actively engaging in projects like this. 
It's not illegal. There's an uncovering of everything, like a new Magellan-like map of the inner world of our genome. But the purposes that that will be put towards are not necessarily health-based. Obviously, the military wants to make super soldiers. Obviously, we have a space program to look after, and we want to be able to live on Mars. We're going to need some special humans for that. What's interesting to me is to help people understand all the ways they could go in. What are the other ways that this could go that might even be preferable? What if we became solar powered, right? Like what if humans actually could photosynthesize? What would be good about that? Well, you wouldn't need to pay rent because you'd have central heating. You wouldn't need to work because all you have to do is sit in a hammock. Um, skin cancer would probably go up. People around the equator would become obese. The Nordic races would be suddenly really skinny and have to run down to the equator during the winter, like at the dark, suicidal end of the long night. And, you know, in a neo-colonial way, probably eat some really overweight Equatorian solar-powered people. And weirdly, we might actually grow to be flat and have webs underneath our arms that collect more sun. That could be a problem, but it could be great. Like a giant, flat, bat-like, solar-collecting human beatnik. From Radiotopia, you're listening to Love & Radio. I'm Nick Vanderkolk. Today's episode, Doing the No-No, featuring Adam Zaretsky. So there's that. Well, should we call it a night? Cool. Well, uh, thanks everyone for your time. Um, and uh, I hope this was helpful. Uh, and I would just ask that you uh, tell other folks about it. And um, if you found these tools helpful, like share them. Um, that's what they're there for. And I'm really hoping that. Uh, you know, I, 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 I do want to sort of mix things up a little bit and um, show that there are alternatives to using Pro Tools and that you can make really great work without having to spend a ton of money. Um, and uh, I hope that other folks feel as empowered by the, you know, the software as, as that I have. So um, with that, I guess I will uh, wish you all good night. Thanks, Brendan. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much.